Welcome, folks. Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Jackman Radio. As always, I'm your host, Eric Jackman, joined by my twin brother, Mike. And we are psyched today. This is going to be a really interesting conversation I've been looking to have for a long time. Um, we are joined, coming from England right now, Mr. David Whelan. He's a researcher, TV producer, um, and filmmaker who has dug deeply into the death of John Lennon. So there's some very interesting stuff he's dug up. And we're really looking forward to talking to him. David, thanks for joining us today, man. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Yeah, this is going to be very interesting. So I guess just for the people who haven't heard of you or your work, tell us a little bit about your background, who you are, and what got you going into this. Okay. Uh, I'm from London, uh, Irish heritage, uh, Irish parents. Um, so I started in television in 1983. Um, I was 17 at the time. I was very lucky. I got a job at Thames Television, uh, which is a uh, national station in London, uh, in, in the UK. Incredibly lucky break at 17 to do that. So that got me, that was incredibly 40 years ago now, got me started in television as a trainee in the film department. Um, from that point onwards, did lots of different things in television, mainly sports, did a lot of stuff for FIFA, uh, had a very lucky career. Um, so now I'm kind of mid 50s. I wouldn't say I'm retired, but I'm kind of semi-retired. I'm not really needing to look for any big projects anymore. Uh, and what happened was uh, in lockdown, like a lot of people, um, I started to kind of relax and take my foot off the accelerator and just kind of look around. And my antennas were a little bit more open than they probably usually were. And I sort of got rid of all the projects that were kind of, you know, distracting me over the years. Uh, and um, I was just literally walking in a field one day and um, I was listening to a podcast and someone mentions that the doorman at the Dakota might have been a CIA operative. And I just thought, wow, that's that's interesting. When when John Lennon was assassinated, I thought, that's incredible. That's if that's true, that would be very interesting. I've never heard this before. Um, and then I went home and started to Google and five pages of notes turned into 50 pages of notes turned into 300 pages of notes and I just started to just go deeper and deeper into it and the more I looked into it the more I realized none of this makes sense there's just so many different anomalies so many things don't add up and from that point onwards three years ago that's that's pretty much all I've ever done now for the last three years is, is to focus on this I knew it had to be a book so I started writing the book uh, which is now complete thankfully and uh, it's just astonishing how little the world actually knows about this seismic, you know, event. Yeah, we were kind of saying that before we were on air. Um, I've always been fascinated by um, American assassinations and assassinations of, you know, political figures. We, obviously, the Kennedy assassinations. Um and I, I knew kind of what the, the gist was of, of the night that Lennon was shot and killed and, and kind of what mm. was out there. Um, but mm. it was kind of scant in a lot of ways. There weren't really a lot of details. There was over the years, I noticed some conflicting things, you know, from witness statements. Um, and before we get into that too much, you, you alluded to the doorman potentially mm. being like a CIA guy or Bay of Pigs veteran. And of course, you're referring to uh, Jose Padermo and um you know, he's kind of a, a central figure in all this and he, he's no longer with us, right? That's right. Yeah. Um, he was one of the first sort of guys I had to get figured out, really. Um, to give you a little context, for seven years, no one heard Jose Padermo's name after John Lennon's murder. So John Lennon was murdered on December the 8th, 1980. And for seven years, the doorman was just called the doorman. And sometimes the concierge was called the doorman, but he was actually Jay Hastings, the concierge. So the doorman was a bit of a mystery. And then a, a journalist called Jim Gaines in 1987 wrote a People magazine article where he mentioned the doorman's name for the first time, Jose Badermo. But he also mentioned that he was an anti-Castro Cuban who wanted to talk to Mark Chapman about the JFK assassination. So you can imagine people's antennas suddenly pricked up and thought, hang on a minute, JFK assassination, anti-Castro Cuban. When they then did a bit more research and they realized that there was a, a Bay of Pigs CIA operative called Jose Padermo, who was in charge of a very serious group of people who were called Operation 40, who were a brigade of uh, right wing Cubans who were working for the CIA. And their job was to go in after the Bay of Pigs invasion and kind of clean up really in a rather nasty fashion, I suspect. But these guys were a group of 
very serious individuals who were, you know, operatives, counter uh, kind of insurgent operatives for the CIA in, in Cuba. So they've done lots of missions trying to unstable the, 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 the communist Castro government. So the guy that was in charge of them, Jose Padermo, would have been a very, very serious individual if he was in charge of that group of people. So for him to be working the door on, on the night John Lennon was assassinated, that would have been an absolutely huge deal. But after researching it for a long time now, I can pretty much say that the guy that was working the door at the Dakota probably almost certainly wasn't Bay of Pigs, Jose Padermo. It's, 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 there's a, a small percentage that it might be the same guy, but it's highly unlikely, highly unlikely. Didn't he start in the mid to late seventies and he even stayed on afterwards, but opted to go inside kind of after the shooting. So he wouldn't be, that's right. Yeah. He wouldn't be close to cameras and he had some kind of leg or back issue or something. So yeah, there's a lot, there's a lot of questions we still need to ask about Dakota, uh, Jose Padermo, a hell of a lot of questions we need to ask, but the, the op 40 Jose Padermo was probably born much earlier than Dakota Jose Padermo. Dakota Jose Padermo started at the Dakota on the door around about 69, 70, and he finished working there in 92. So we're talking a long stint there. Um, the actual CIA Jose Padermo didn't really stop operating until the mid 70s. We know this because he used to work with a guy called Frank Sturgis, who incredibly was one of the Watergate burglars. So it's all amazing how these things are connected. But Sturgis isn't the most, uh, honest guy in the world. So if he says he stopped working in 75, we can take that maybe with a pinch of salt. But I just can't understand how a guy as serious as Bay of Pigs Padermo would have bothered to work the door at the Dakota for that amount of years. I just don't think that's a job that he would have been interested in. And if he was there to be ready to help out in John Lennon's assassination, that's a hell of a long gig to wait for that to happen. So. I just, and also, you know, I spoke to a guy called Larry Hancock, who's written some books on the JFK assassination. He's quite an expert on the Op 40 crew. And he said to me, you know, these guys change their name all the time. You know, changing their name was just something they did. Like we have breakfast. Why would he keep his, keep his name? You know, it, it just doesn't make sense. So I'm 99% certain now that, that Dakota Jose Padermo is not Bear Pigs Jose Padermo, which is very important because it's been a, it's been a bit of a red herring and people get a bit obsessed about it and they get hung up on it. And really it's not that important though, though the actual Dakota Jose Padermo is a man of interest. And I'll explain to you why that one of the main reasons why is he should have seen everything that night, but for some reason, the authorities don't want to release his witness statement. Now they've released quite a lot of witness statements to a book in 1992 by a journalist called Jack Jones, but that's one statement that they refuse to release, which I find very strange. Now I've spoken, I shouldn't say spoken, I've communicated with Kim Hogreth, who is the assistant DA uh, at the New York District Attorney's Office, and he's confirmed to me that they did interview Jose Padermo, Dakota Jose Padermo, as a man of great interest. So we know those interviews happened. We know from the people on the night who said that he went back to the police station to be interviewed. So there's definitely witness statements from Jose, but for some reason they do not want us to know what he said and what he did that that night. Now I've got a pretty good idea what he said and did through talking to other people who were there just shortly after the murder. Um, but he's a mystery guy. He's definitely a mystery guy. And that you, you alluded, Mike, the fact that he wasn't working in the door at the time. And that's also true. He was, he was a guy who apparently had problems with his legs leading up to John Lennon's murder. And he often stayed and worked in the back office. But that particular night, rather suspiciously, he asked to work the door again uh, because it was a warm night and allegedly he felt the warm night wasn't going to upset his poor legs. Uh, so he went out and took in the warm air and was working the door when for quite a while previously to that, he wasn't working the door at the Dakota. So he made sure he was on the door that night, which again is odd. Things he said to Chapman allegedly after Chapman shot John Lennon is rather odd. He tended to be in a bit of a hurry for Chapman to leave the scene, which is a bit strange when you consider Chapman at that time didn't have a gun on him and, and was just placidly reading a book. So you wonder what, what Jose was concerned about and why he was asking him to run away. Um, and also after that night, Jose made absolute certain that he was not going to work the Dakota door anymore. So he went back into the back office on December the 9th, the very next day, and was never seen working the door again. Um, 
And we know he had very poor English. So I'm not quite sure what he did in the office area when uh, he couldn't really answer the phone properly. And we know from other people that had to cover the door for him at the time, that they got very angry that they had to keep getting pulled back into the office to answer the phone for Jose. So Jose Padermo is still a man of great interest. And if you, if you think about if Mark Chapman was a Manchurian candidate and was triggered to commit an act that he possibly wasn't committing, uh, the man who was closest to him to do that would have been Jose Padermo. So there's a lot of questions that still need to be asked about Jose. Yeah, I mean, just obviously with the gun, but even, you know, what happened with the gun after Chapman, you know, shot Lennon. Um, but even before that, I've read even years ago that Chapman was almost kind of had a camaraderie with Padermo throughout the day because, uh, you know, he was there most of the day. And then, of course, Lennon left to go to a recording session and then came back. And the other people had petered out, you know, because obviously at the Dakota, there was always a small gaggle of fans and people that wanted to get a glimpse of Lennon or get an autograph or a photo or something like that. But, I mean, you know, I think by official accounts, Chapman was, was there all day. And that was one of the several days that he had gone and visited the Dakota. Is that So is that true that he was talking to Padermo pretty much on and off all day before the shooting? They had a rapport, for sure. Uh, Chapman's spoken about his chats with Jose. Um, Chapman was also there in November. He flew out on the 29th of October and spent about a week in, in New York, uh, where he also was talking to the doorman at the time. So I think him and Jose definitely had a relationship in November, and they certainly were speaking in the, in the days leading up to December the 8th. So, yeah, there was definitely a rapport there. There's even reports that Chapman gave Padermo some money, but I'm not quite sure how, how that works into anything. But... But yeah, for sure, there was a camaraderie there. If, if you go by what Jim Gaines was saying in his 1987 People magazine article, uh, Chapman was discussing the Bay of Pigs. He was discussing uh, the Kennedy assassination. And they were, you know, they were having a good old chinwag uh, before the murder. So it, it's, Jose's interesting. We've only just recently, or I've only just recently been given uh, by a very, a very lovely fellow in Chile, he actually sent me a picture of Jose just a few days ago. Uh, where I've actually, we can now actually see his face for the first time. There was a, a paparazzi picture of, of Jose in the background behind John, where his face is a little bit blurred, but now we can see him. And uh, that was a revelation to finally get to see this man's face for the first time. And that will be useful if we can ever get a picture of Bay of Pigs, Jose Padermo. Uh, but there is no actual official picture of Bay of Pigs, Jose Padermo. There's quite a few pictures online of lots of different people who allegedly are, you know, the Dakota Jose and the Bay of Pigs Jose, but they're all wildly different and they're nothing like the guy that we now have got standing outside the Dakota. Right. So we can now we can now put a face to it. Yeah, it's kind of that wilderness of mirrors in that world. That uh, is it Angleton who talked about the wilderness of mirrors? James yeah. Angleton about about just that that murky world. Um, so yeah, David, if if you had to tell somebody who was not really even familiar with the official story of John Lennon's death. Um, if you could just for a little bit summarize what the official story is and who Mark David Chapman is. Good idea. Really good idea. So the official story is, I'll, I'll go with the murder first. Uh, John Lennon and Yoko Ono are out at a recording studio making some music on the 8th of December, 1980. Um, they decide to come home uh, at round about 10.30. They leave the studio. Reports are that John was going to stop off at a diner, wanted to stop off at a diner and get some food. But for some reason, they never did that and they drove straight back to the Dakota in a long gray limousine. When they pulled up outside the Dakota, there were two people standing outside the Dakota gates. One was Jose Padermo and one was Mark Chapman. Uh, apparently Yoko Ono got out first, though there are lots of different reports about who got out first. And Yoko has given five statements. And in each statement, she's slightly changed about whether she got out first or John got out first. So that one's still open for debate. I'm pretty certain from talking to other people that Yoko got out first. She walked ahead of John into the Dakota driveway, walking over, if you imagine the Dakota driveway as a tunnel, she's walking over to the right where there's a door, a glass vestibule door, which is an entrance into the lobby, into the Dakota building. So Yoko is probably 15, 20 feet ahead of John. John then exits the, the limousine and follows Yoko. Standing on the left of the tunnel by the, drive, by the roadside, by the pavement is Mark Chapman. John walks past Mark Chapman, walks towards the vestibule glass doors over to the right. He's probably 20, 25 feet away from Mark Chapman at this point. Mark Chapman then allegedly gets out a gun, 
and shoots John five times in the back. Now, if you listen to Mark's account, Mark says four bullets hit John in the back and one bullet went astray. From that point onwards, uh, it's kind of very vague about whether John collapsed in the driveway, whether John collapsed in the doorway, whether John collapsed on the stairway. But of course, for Mark Chapman to be outside in the driveway by the pavement, John would have had to have been outside the vestibule door area. He couldn't be indoors. He couldn't be in a stairway because obviously Mark Chapman couldn't see him, never alone hit him in that particular area. So going by the official report, he must have been shot outside the vestibule door area. John then incredibly managed to open the vestibule door, which is a door you can pull open. So he would have pulled this door open. He then would have walked into a little porch area. He then allegedly walked up five, possibly six steps. He then had two more oak doors that he had to pull open, which were always shut. He pulled these doors open. Now remember, he's got four bullets in his back at this point. He then had to turn left and go through a little uh, sl uh, swinging door, which is by the Dakota lobby desk area, by the, um, the front desk area. He walks through that swinging door into the concierge's front office. According to the concierge, Jay Hastings, he then says to Jay Hastings, I've been shot, which is incredible that you could even talk at that point. He runs past uh, Jay Hastings, according to Jay, like a drunken man, stumbling. He then manages to get into a back office, which is probably another 10, 12 feet beyond the front office. And there he collapsed and uh, pretty much uh, expired at that point, though some police say that he spoke to them in the police cars. So that's where John ended up. And this incredible tale of, of uh, strength by John is, is kind of put together mainly from the concierge, Jay Hastings testimony. Uh, and now Jay is what is an interesting witness, Jay, because his window, the concierge's window, was just behind the vestibule doors where John was heading to. And those windows were open and they were a bay window. It was quite a warm night. And Jay Hastings said that he could hear John approaching the vestibule doors. He got used to hearing his footsteps. He got used to hearing the limo pull up. It, you know, Jay had worked there for a few years at that point. So he kind of got to know when people are coming and going. He kind of expected John and Yoko to be back at that point. He says he remembers hearing the vestibule doors swing open. Then he heard gunfire. He then says a few moments later, John comes staggering into his front office and runs past him into the back office. And then a few moments later, Yoko comes running in after and says, John's been shot, call an ambulance. So that's, that's pretty much the official story. Um, and it's got a lot of holes in it, <laughs> a hell of a lot of holes, especially when you take into account what other people said and you take into account forensics, it, it just doesn't make sense. Yeah, because I think one account is they got him into a police car to bring him to Roosevelt Hospital. And yeah. the, the police were saying, you know, trying to just, obviously John's in shock. I think, you know, of the wounds itself and shock is on the official cause of death. Um, and they said, you know, well, who are you? What's your name? And he said, I'm John Lennon. And supposedly those were his last words. I've read that account. I don't know if you've read that. And like he's going yeah. in and out of consciousness and, yeah, you know, I don't, you know, what's what's the deal on that? The well, I've, spoken to, uh, I've spoken to the two cops who first found him in the back office. Uh, there, there are two guys. One's called Officer Herb Framberg and the other one's called Officer Tony Palmer. They weren't the first two cops to arrive on the scene. That was Officer Spiro and Officer Peter Cullen. And Spiro and Cullen were pretty much, when they first arrived on the scene, they were dealing with Mark Chapman, who at that point was just standing by the roadside reading a book in a very docile fashion. He'd taken his coat off, put his coat on the floor. He's reading a book. Jose Padermo IDs him and said, he's the guy. Some reports say that Chapman turned around to Spiro and Cullen and said, I'm the only one, which is a very strange thing for a man to say. But some reports say he said that. Um, Cullen was then called by Jay Hastings, who shouted out to Cullen, there's a man shot in here. So Cullen is the first officer that went into the back office and saw John splayed down on his front, like kind of spread eagle. And he could see Cullen that this was a man who was seriously injured or possibly dead. Cullen then comes back out into the driveway. And at that point, Framberger and Palmer turn up. And Framberger and Palmer go both together into the back office they see John lying there. They turn him over onto his front and they can see that there's a lot of blood on his chest area. Now, neither of them have said, very importantly, that they didn't, they, none of them saw any holes in John's back. Now, you would think if Chapman shot him four times in his back, they would say, oh, yeah, he had four big holes in his back. No holes in his back. But they both said there was a lot of holes and a lot of blood in John's chest area. 
these were the two cops who then decided that they had to get John out of there because he was, you know, pretty much, you know, allegedly there was a pulse. But if you go by what Jay Hastings said, John was dead at this point. Uh, Palmer and Framberger then lift John up. Hastings says that he helped them, but most people say they didn't see Hastings do this. So we'll have to go with one or the other, but maybe Hastings helped, maybe he didn't. But ultimately, we do know Palmer and Framberger carried John through the driveway. Mark Chapman has said that he remembers seeing John being carried past him, being put into a police car of another officer, a guy called Officer Moran, James Moran. And James Moran sped off at top speed to the Roosevelt Hospital. Framberger and Palmer then took Yoko in their car behind Moran's car to the hospital. Now, Officer Moran is the guy who started the legend that John... Uh, when he was asked who you, who you are or do you know who you are, he said, yeah, I'm John Lennon. I don't believe that's true. Uh, everyone I've spoken to from Framberger, Palmer, Hastings, uh, the lift operator, which we'll get to in a moment, Joseph Manning, they've all said he was dead, <laughs> pretty much. He was, there was just too much blood. His body was limp. There was no way that man was going to be talking to anyone in the police car. So I think what I've discovered when I've been doing this for the last three years is people annoyingly add little details to try and build themselves more into the story and i'm pretty certain james moran was using this opportunity to give uh you know he's part of history james he did drive the body to the hospital but i think he was trying to make something a bit more interesting than it was uh, whether they should have moved him or not is another really important question um i think today they're getting a lot of trouble for doing that to be honest um the roosevelt hospital wasn't that far away i'm not sure how long it would have took for an ambulance to get there I think John might have had a better chance if they waited, to be honest, but we'll never know. Yeah, kind of a split second, uh, quick, of course, life or death decision and not one any of us would ever want to be forced to be put into. Um, so, yeah, sure. that, that's that's pretty much what people know about the official story. Um, and then so Mark David Jap Chapman's uh, Chapman's background um, to your average yeah. person. I mean, who is he and, and what was kind of the obvious information about him that was out there versus what you've discovered about him. Oh, wow. Okay. So the official story about Mark Chapman has changed a little bit. They, it's kind of what you'll find in all the documentaries and books about John Lennon's murder is you get an awful lot of the where and when. So they say it was Dakota 1050 and it was in the driveway. They don't really go into how it went down that night. And we're going to talk a lot about that later. And they don't, don't really talk about the why, i.e. the motive of why the hell this guy felt compelled to use his words to do this but mark chapman was born in a very average uh decatur a very average small georgian town uh average life up until the age of 15 he had a sister wasn't particularly close to his sister uh his dad was military always seems to be a military dad in these lone nuts lives but anyway i'm sure there's nothing to see there but his dad was i think an airman uh the mum was a nurse pretty average family there's talk of the dad was a bit heavy-handed there's talk I spoke to some of his friends and said that the mum was the problem, not the dad. Yeah, they probably both, you know, had their moments. Um, what we do know is that around about 15, Mark started to, when you talk to all of Mark's friends, the thing that I sort of discovered was he was one of these guys who was always on the periphery, desperate to get into the in crowd, desperate to be cool. But he just, Mark socially was a bit awkward. He didn't really cut it. We all remember these guys at school that just, you know, just didn't quite, fit into the crowd and they were he was one of these guys i think he just tried too hard and he was desperate to you know he wanted to be accepted and be you know he tried to play the guitar you know he tried to be one of the cool kids and he just according to most people just he just it was a bit of a, a bit of an annoyance really he was always kind of hanging around in the background desperate to please is another thing that i kept on hearing which is interesting um what we do know is around about 15, he started to get into drugs for sure. He started to, he went down the usual route that most people do when they're teens. He started off with, with some hash and then he got into some acid and then he probably did a bit of speed. Who knows? He, he did all sorts of things. He didn't do heroin. I'm, I'm pretty certain about that. I've spoken to a lot of people who did drugs with Mark Chapman, but his main drug at the time was LSD and he did an awful lot of LSD as a lot of kids did at the time. Um, not sure if that would have been too good for his psyche. Um, not sure if that's where a lot of Mark's troubles started. But what happened after that was uh, he, he, he found Jesus. Um, there was a guy that came to his school, an interesting guy called Arthur Blessett, who was known as the psychedelic preacher. Fantastic phrase. 
And Arthur was one of these guys. He, he came out of San Francisco and he was a bit of a huckster and he liked to kind of mix evangelicalism with, you know, taking drugs. And, he, you know, he, he, obviously he didn't dish out drugs as far as I know. But, you know, he was talking about getting high with Jesus. And he was he, he probably did a lot of good work, actually, getting kids off drugs and putting them into a more, you know, productive, uh, productive area. But um, he went to Mark's school. And he was one of these guys who did about, you know, I don't know if you guys are aware that sort of charismatic Christianity kind of stuff where, you know, he, he kind of has the spirit of God in his hand and people come up and he touches you and they all fall back. And oh, yeah, I've just been, yeah, that's the one. And uh, I spoke to one of Mark's best friends who was there at that particular moment with Mark. And uh, he wants to remain anonymous, so I'll, I'll keep his identity anonymous. But he basically said they went there just to have a laugh. You know, just to go there and, and, and just have a have a joke around with these guys and, and, and you know, um, see what, what fun can be had with, with the Christians. And um, this guy went up there and he, you know, he pretended to fall back when uh, you know, Arthur, bless it, pressed his hand on his head. And he's oh, the Lord is in me and all this stuff. Mark did the same. They went back to their pew and they're both there laughing away. Well, this friend was laughing away going, wasn't that hilarious? My goodness, I can't believe people are falling for this. But then Mark turned around to him and went, no, I, something happened to me up there. I felt something. I, I, I felt the Lord in me. Um, and from that point onwards, uh, so this would have been around about sort of 1970, 1971, Mark became part of what's known as the Jesus, Jesus Freak uh, movement where he uh, literally became a bit of a monk. He, he started to wear this big wooden cross uh, around his jumper and he'd sort of walk around and he just became a bit of an evangelical kind of guy trying to convert everybody to the point where a lot of his friends became very annoyed with him. And he's constantly saying to them, you know, we need to, you know, you need to see the way, find the path, become part of Christ. So at that point, all the drugs went to one side and Mark became this evangelical guy. Um, now, at that point, you think that that could be the end of the Mark Chapman story. Um, but then an incident happened to Mark, which I think is a very pivotal incident. Uh, he was very much part of the Southern Baptist network, Mark. He was he had a lot of Southern Baptist people around him at this point. And when he was, I would say, 15, late 15, maybe early 16, he was sent to a prayer group. Uh, I know now who conducted this prayer group. And it was a, a preacher with a sideline in hypnotism. Uh, I'm not going to reveal his name now, but this is a very dubious gentleman. And amazingly, there was actually back in those days an organization that tried to fuse Christianity with hypnotism. And they actually had they actually had their own kind of conference and stuff where you would get preachers who had sidelines in hypnotism saying how the two things should go hand in hand, which is highly dubious if you ask me but mark went to this uh, prayer group which was wasn't a prayer group at all it was a lot of very dark charismatic ghost busting there was a lot of exorcism stuff going on there was people barking like dogs there was speaking in tongues mark remembers people pressing down on him he remembers it being a deeply disturbing moment in his life and i think that was a pivotal moment for mark and i think the person behind it was potentially breaking mark's psyche to have him prepared for other more uh useful um, um let's say how can i put this i, I think if, if you're going to break someone and have them psychologically dependent let's let's be kind and say groom them often you will read that they try to break them with this kind of very scary um psychological scarring and something like exorcisms where you're convinced that demons are coming out of you and and you're speaking in tongues and there's all these people around you with all this kind of charismatic mumbo jumbo as i would personally call it uh i think that's going to mess up a guy like mark chapman who was at that point a heavy lsd user only a few months prior uh which i'm sure the people that were doing that to mark at that prayer group were possibly aware of so Mark was a very suggestible guy. And I think that particular moment was a very important moment for Mark. Um, I'll just quickly, because we could be here on Mark all day. So I'll, I'll briefly now take you forward to where we get to Y. So what he then did was he went to work for the YMCA. He went to work at a Vietnamese refugee camp for children. Um, he was a bit of a loser. He went from job to job. But at this time, he then got hooked up with another interesting man a, a police officer called dana reeves now when mark first met dana 
Dana was two years older than Mark and he was a security guard. And he was, uh, by all accounts, a very dark individual who used to scare people that were in his presence. And they could never quite figure out why the kind of Christian loving, uh, eager to please Mark Chapman would hang around with Dana. And more importantly, they could never figure out why Dana would want to hang around with Mark. But Dana gave Mark a, a room in his house and he became... He became his best friend for a few years leading up to when Mark went to Hawaii in 77 and Dana got Mark a job as a security guard. He uh, used to rough house Mark. There used to be a lot of playing around with guns. And by all accounts, by everyone who saw them together, whenever Mark was around Dana, he completely changed and he was completely subservient to Dana. And Dana was pretty much almost like a kind of handler, you could say, for Mark Chapman at that point. Um, now, Dana Reeves became a police officer and he's quite famous. He's the guy who allegedly gave Mark Chapman the bullets that shot John Lennon. So we'll, we'll get to that a bit further on in the Mark Chapman story. But bear that in mind, Dana Reeves is a very important person in the Mark Chapman story. Um, so after Mark had a little stint in Beirut, as you do, uh, apparently he went there with the YMCA um, and spent, I'd say, 10 days there, holed up in a hotel. There was a war going on around there. A lot of people say, oh, that was a CIA assassination camp he went to. There's no evidence of any of that. I think he just went there and it was a really badly planned YMCA trip. And he was in a, he was in a war zone that he shouldn't have been in. And he came home and said it was all a bit exciting, but I didn't really do much. And I'm pretty certain that's what happened there. I don't think there's anything uh, nefarious in his Beirut trip. Um, but he tried to uh, get into sort of being a, a, a preacher. He went to a seminary school and tried to get into theology. He, he flunked that. Uh, he split up with his girlfriend. So we're talking now, Mark's, so this is 77. So Mark is around about 21, 22, and his kind of life's not really taking off. He's lost his girlfriend. He can't really hold down a job. He's not gonna be a preacher. He's not smart enough to do that. Dana Reeves is getting him security jobs with guns. But for, for Mark, it, life just wasn't really happening for him. It wasn't taking off, I think, the way he wanted it to. And then he surprised everybody by flying off to Hawaii. Now, if you listen to Mark's uh, way of seeing it, he just wanted to go there to kill himself, allegedly. Uh, why he needed to go to paradise to do that, I'm not quite sure. But um, that was Mark's story. Uh, allegedly, he sold everything and just flew off to Hawaii with a few hundred pounds in his, a few hundred, do few hundred dollars in his pocket, stayed in a few hotels. He then went and got a car, uh, a, a hose, uh, for his car, put the hose into his window and allegedly tried to kill himself and, and flunk that by the hose didn't fit properly and there was still air getting in. And uh, uh, allegedly a fisherman came by and saved him. Um, so that happened probably mid 77. And then Mark started to see a psychiatrist, um, a lady called, Ju I forget her name now, it'll come to me in a moment. But this psychiatrist then took him to a mental hospital, a psychiatric hospital on the other side of the island uh, called the Castle Memorial Hospital, which was run by the Seventh-day Adventists. Um, there were a lot near, there were a lot closer, more geared up uh, psychiatric hospitals that Mark could have gone to. But for some reason, he was taken and put in the care of the Seventh-day Adventists, uh, where he spent six months going under all kinds of interesting um, therapies. Uh, if you listen to what some people say online, it was all kinds of drugs going on and 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 you know, nefarious activities there's no there's no evidence of that we don't know what they did people have asked to see the records of what they did with mark chapman when he was at the memorial hospital they refused to release those records on allegedly confidential grounds um what we do know is that mark did so well there after six months that he became a janitor there and started to work for the hospital so he went from patient to employee and which is a bit strange in six months. What people don't understand about the Seventh-day Adventists is they have a history of providing um, guinea pigs to the American military. Um, they did this in the 60s and 70s for the Adventists that didn't want to fight in the Korean War. And what they did was they gave up their followers to be used as experiments for chemicals and uh, all kinds of uh, interesting dubious warfare. So the Adventists are not as benign as they perhaps may come across. And it was interesting that Mark got put into their care. And you have to kind of wonder, was Mark some kind of 
experiment potentially for someone we don't know we just don't know what he did in that hospital i hope one day the records come out wasn't it that hospital david that gave him all the money to do all that traveling later on to all those other countries that's a whole i I always thought that was weird where did he get all that money and why did they basically give that to him you're dead right mike it's beyond weird basically he's a janitor he had no collateral he had no money and what happened was they he decided that he wanted to do a global trip now this is this is an incredible global trip if i if i was here reading off the countries he went to i'd be here all day he went everywhere he went to the far east he went to india he went to europe it was a it was a kind of trip that someone in in their comfortable retirement couldn't pull off i think from a financial point of view but for some reason the the seventh day adventists wanted to give him all this money and right even back then it was still an expensive trip because people would say oh it's the 70s it wasn't really that much and no, even back then, man, it still would have been a big, big to do. Very suspect. The Beirut thing, I don't think there's much going on there. This global trip that Mark went on is very suspicious in my eyes. You know, he went, he went to see some YMCA friends that he knew. He apparently went to a United Nations um, day out and met some dignitaries there. He went to London. He. And what's interesting about it is, if if you see some documentaries, there's a hell of a lot of photography of Mark Chapman on this global trip, but we know he went solo. So the first question I'd like to ask is, this is the day before, you know, taking pictures in those days wasn't easy. Who was taking the pictures? That's what I'd like to know. There's a hell of a lot of pictures of Mark Chapman all over the world. I'd love to know who the cameraman was. Interesting. Yeah. Um, So has he spoken? I mean, what has he said about this trip? Has he just said, yeah, I was just traveling for this church group and just seeing yeah, the world and he, just you know. wanted, wanted to see the world i think that there's been a few official lines about it a book in a library inspired him to do it i've read somewhere he said that he was just sweeping the floor as a janitor and he just thought i need something a bit more excitement in my life why they gave him all that money when there was no chance he was ever going to pay it back is totally beyond me it's it's a yeah. very mysterious trip but the person who organized that trip for him was a, was a travel agent called gloria abe um who um apparently got very close to Mark very quickly to the point where he started to send her postcards from wherever he was abroad. And then when he came back from his global jaunt, Glory was there at the airport to sort of, you know, put, put him in his, in her arms. And very quickly they became man and wife and Gloria was, is, is still is a big part of Mark's, Mark's life. Um, what's, what's interesting about Gloria is, is, is she immediately started to work at the, at the Memorial hospital and they lived together, they worked together. She became the new Dana Reeves, really, in his life, that person who was always there 24-7 sorting out Mark's life. Um, and I still, to this day, can't quite figure out why she stayed with Mark um, and why she still... If, if you if you want to get to Mark Chapman today, if you want to talk to him, you, you have to go through Gloria. Gloria still handles all of Mark's affairs and access and she became a, a staunch Christian after marrying Mark. And what's interesting with that is that the, the group of Christians who allegedly converted her to Christianity is a group called the Navigators, who were a Christian organization that were deeply uh, connected to the military. So imagine in Hawaii, there would have been untold military bases. That's where the Navigators operated. And they were the people that managed to convert Gloria to Christianity, which is an interesting uh interesting thing to observe when mark left the castle memorial hospital he started to live with another southern baptist preacher uh, a guy called peter anderson who had a small church that he was trying to build on the island like a lot of baptist preachers that were connected to mark uh peter had a military background and i can't quite figure out why he gave up his home to mark chapman um if you talk to the people that were socializing with mark at the memorial Memorial hospital at the time he was almost um becoming normal again he was he was married to gloria he was going around to the house for dinner he was having you know having a normal social life allegedly when peter anderson came into his life that all stopped and all the fun stopped all the parties stopped and it, it got all got very much into scripture again mark and you've got to stop doing these sinful parties that you go to and, and that was kind of the end of Mark's, I would say, normal life once he started to uh, shack up with Peter Anderson. Um, and then we get to the fatal year of 1980, where things really start to get interesting. Is there anything I've missed there, guys? Is there anything you... 
No, that's that's pretty thorough. Um, but of course, you brought up Dana Reeves, and I remember reading about him in Fenton Bresler's book. Um, he was worried that after the shooting, they were going to arrest him as an accomplice, or or to to get more information, or um, because yeah. possibly you know Chapman didn't realize. Uh, okay, I can fly uh, on a plane with this gun, but uh, you know I, you can't get bullets in New York. You're not going to be able to buy any bullets. So he gave him the bullets, and he was worried that the investigators were going to come after him. Okay, it's an interesting story. So Mark first went to Mark felt we'll get back we'll go back a little bit to 1980 in a minute and we'll talk about catching the rye and my, why Mark felt compelled at that particular point to to murder John Lennon. But we'll just fast forward to October 29th where Mark uh, has to fly out to New York to kill John Lennon. Now in the calendar that Mark and Gloria shared, Gloria wrote at the top of the October 29th. Mark has finished capturing the ride. Mark is flying to New York. So it's quite interesting that Gloria connected those two things together. I don't know why she wanted to put down and mark down that Mark had to finish capturing the ride before he went off to kill John Lennon. Allegedly, Gloria didn't know he was going to do that, and we'll get to that in a moment. So we, we do know that Mark went to New York on the 29th of October. I've got the hotel records. I know when he checked in. I know when he checked out. He stayed in three hotels. One of the hotels he stayed in, Round about the 3rd or 4th of October, he rings a number in Atlanta, the Henry County Sheriff's Office, which is where a certain Dana Reeves worked. Uh, now, he had three very long conversations, according to the phone records that I've got from those hotels, with it must be Dana Reeves. I can't see who else it would have been. Um, and then a few days later, he flies down to see Dana and asks Dana for some hollow point bullets for protection from muggers in New York. Now, if you listen to the Dana Reeves version of things, he, he kind of, he, you know, Mark threw this at him as almost a surprise. It's like, oh, I'm in New York and I'm worried about muggers. Can you give me some bullets? As if it was something that just came up out of nowhere. But that can't be true if he was having long conversations with Dana just a few days earlier. So clearly Dana knew what he was doing, I think, in New York at the time. What, what were they talking about for these three long conversations? The weather, you know, the latest movies? It, it's It's possible that mark was saying look i've come over here with a gun and i don't have any bullets can you sort me out dana and then you've got to kind of wonder who was instigating who here was dana instigating mark or was mark instigating dana there's no proof of any of that but it's very interesting that those phone calls have been hushed up and the police knew about these phone calls by the way uh you know i got these records from the police records so they're just one of a number of cover-ups that the police have decided not to uh, not to get into. And even in fact, when I was talking to lead detective Ron Hoffman about Dana Reeves in my first early conversations with him, he was very keen not to mention Dana's name. He just he just called him the New York cop, uh, the, the Atlanta cop friend. And then when I mentioned Dana's name to Ron, he went, "Oh, you know about him, do you?" So even now today, the New York police, uh, the ex New York police, are still trying to cover up. Dana and who he was and what his part was in the in the Mark Chapman story. But to get back to when Mark flew back to Atlanta from New York in, in mid-October, he asked Dana for these hollow bullets. Dana gave him the hollow bullets. Mark then flew back to New York with the hollow bullets, uh, stood outside the Dakota for a few days, couldn't see John Lennon, had a chit chat with the doorman, who was probably Jose Paderma. And then Mark goes to see Ordinary People. I don't know if you guys know that film, kind of saccharine uh, movie from the time. And according, yeah, and, and according to that, according to legend or according to Mark, that film uh, made Mark decide that he didn't want to continue with his with his uh, desire to kill John Lennon at that point. And he flies back to Hawaii with his gun, with Dana Reeves hollow bullets, and he goes to see Gloria and he puts the gun and the bullets uh, on, on the table in front of Gloria. And he says, I went to New York to kill John Lennon, but your love for me, Gloria, has, has made me realize that I don't want to do it. And um, I'm not going to carry it through. And according to some reports, he threw the gun in the ocean. I, I don't think he did. Um, but we do know, he has said quite a few times, Mark, that he, he threw Catching the Rye away, which I find very interesting that when he tried to stop killing John Lennon, when he tried to stop himself murdering John, he felt he, he had to throw that book away to make that happen, which I find a very interesting correlation that he, he saw getting rid of that book as a way of freeing himself from his compulsion to kill John Lennon. Now, you have to ask yourself a question with Gloria Chapman at this point. Why the hell didn't she shop him to the cops at that point? You know, if your husband says, I went to New York to kill John Lennon, here's the gun, here's the bullets. 
at the very least, you'd think she might have gone to psychiatric services and said, look, you need to come and, you know, talk to my husband. But Gloria didn't do that. And Mark was very angry about that. And for the first year when he was incarcerated, he wouldn't see Gloria. And he was furious that she didn't at that point shop him to the police. But Gloria, Gloria never got prosecuted as an accomplice, which I find absolutely baffling. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's where we get to the point where he goes back to New York for a second time. And that's where on well, allegedly on December the 5th from Chicago. And that's where things get very interesting. Yeah, he made uh, some researchers have kind of pointed to that trip to Chicago as kind of an, a weird anomaly. What, what do you think was going on with that? Like what what reason would he have to go out there and like why was he there? Well, we know he went to New York via Chicago. That's that's a fact. Uh, the authorities have not tried to hide that. They just say that there was no stopover. So they say he flew out on the 5th. Got a, got a flight in Chicago and, 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 and you know, onward bound flight to New York. And that's where he ended up on the fifth. Um, the problem is detectives who spoke to Gloria at the time, when she said when Mark left to go to Chicago, she mentioned eight to ten days ago when she mentioned it to the uh, to the detectives that were talking to her. That would have put Mark leaving for Chicago around about the second or third of December, which means he would have had a stopover in Chicago for two or three days. Um, now, the writer of Fenton Brezra in the 80s said that he has evidence. He's seen a plane ticket that was found in Mark Chapman's hotel room that he believes was doctored to make it look like Mark flew out of Chicago on the 5th. But he thinks that Mark actually stayed in Chicago for a few days uh, at a destination we don't know. I personally have no idea. Uh, I think Fenton got a bit hung up on it. And he. I, I don't think Mark needed to, if there was someone triggering Mark in Chicago to do something nefarious. That could have been done quite easily in Hawaii. I don't think Mark needed a Chicago stopover to do, uh, to you know, to, to check in with anyone who was programming and perhaps to do something nefarious. So it's it's interesting. It's uh, it does need investigating. When the NYPD and the district attorney's office released a picture, a redacted picture of Mark's hotel room belongings, they very carefully show the plane ticket, but they don't show the dates. Uh, mm. So that one's still, yeah. that one's still up for grabs. Yeah, and, and I, I want to hear, plug David, your substack, and this is where I've been, you know, doing some reading of your research and what you've looked into, um, and you have just a great uh, kind of bullet point with myth and truth, the 20 most common misconceptions about John Lennon's murder, and you did allude earlier um, to when Lennon collapsed and the cops were there and they saw, you know, blood in his chest area, but no holes in the back, so... I've always just been of the of the mindset that Lennon was hit four or five times and he was shot in the back and the back being a point of entry. So can you talk a little bit about the uh, multiple testimonies, uh, medical testimony and police who, who were there and handled him that Lennon was actually shot in the chest, not the back? Sure. That's, it's important. It's vitally important. Um, if you listen to what Mark Chapman said on the night, if you listen to what Mark Chapman says today, He's always been consistent. Mark Chapman thinks that he shot John Lennon four times in the back with five bullets and one missing. If you listen to the NYPD, they say the same thing. Mark was shot in the back. If you listen to the media at the time, they say, and, and to, uh, shockingly the media today, Mark was shot in the back. So it's in the DA's office, same thing. Mark was shot in the back. So I always believe that. I, why would I not believe that? So when I first started investigating this, I first spoke to a doctor called Frank Veteran. And Frank Veteran is a guy who pops up on the odd documentary and he's popped up in a few magazines saying that he helped save John Lennon's life. Uh, and I had a very long chat with Frank Veteran for about an hour where he sort of spoke to me about this very emotional night. And Frank's even put a video up online talking about this very emotional night. But so, and Frank said that Mark was shot four times in his left side. And I remember thinking, well, that's not what we've been told. So I need to get to the bottom of this. I need to f thank Frank for saying this because he kind of led me on to talk to the real doctor who uh, treated Dr. Uh, who treated John Lennon, a doctor called Dr. Halloran. So I rang Dr. Halloran and I said to Dr. I just had a nice chat with him. And the first question I asked Dr. Halloran was, why wasn't Frank Veteran in the Lennon Report? Now, the Lennon Report is a 2016 dramatic film that was made to get to the bottom of all these strange stories about who actually treated John Lennon when he came into the Roosevelt Hospital that night, because there's been so many different, Frank Veteran has, has obviously thrown his hat in the ring. We'll get to another guy called Stefan Lynn. Dr. Stefan Lynn is a very important character who for 30 years claimed that he was the doctor who who's tried to save John Lennon's life where he did. He was in the room, 
but he, he stood in the background and did you say he mas- massaged John Lennon's heart? Is that that guy? Often, often okay. says that. And and that's, he not, was, that's not true, right? Not, not true. I mean, David Halloran was furious about that. And that's eventually what made Dave, when David Halloran saw Stefan say that for the umpteenth time on a TV show, that's the thing that really instigated David to actually come out of the shadows and say, look, I've had enough. I've been listening to you say this for 30 years. You were in the room for sure, but you were standing in the background. You weren't helping. I was the doctor that was massaging John Lennon's heart. I cut open his chest. I was the main surgeon that night. Um, but the problem with Stefan Lynn is, Stefan Lynn's, th- let's, let's call it embellishments. Let's, let's be kind. His 30 year embellishments meant that investigators, researchers, journalists did not actually look into the medical situation because they just listened to, to Lynn. And they just thought, well, Lynn's the guy. Lynn's not saying that John wasn't shot in the back. So let's just not bother looking any further. So it's very frustrating that for 30 years, the truth was, the medical truth was covered up because of Dr. Lynn's embellishments. I don't think we'll ever see Dr. Lynn on TV again now that Dr. Halloran's come out and said, no, I was the guy. But let's get back to my conversation with with Dr. Halloran. So the first thing I said to Dr. Halloran was, why was Frank Vetran not in the Lennon Report, this dramatic film? He said, well, the reason they didn't feature Frank Vetran in the Lennon Report was he wasn't there. He wasn't in the room, which was a bit of a, a shock. So I said, okay, that's interesting. I just had an hour conversation with him where he was telling me all about it. Um, so the next question I asked, uh, it's almost like a, a kind of by the by question. Because I, again, I thought there was nothing untoward at this point. This was, you know, summer 2020. I said to him, so tell me about the bullets in John's back. Whereabouts on his back were the bullets? And he went, there was no bullet shot into his back. He was shot in his chest. And it was like that kind of Roy Schneider kind of Jaws moment where, it all just went back. I, I thought, oh my, and I, I knew at that point, oh my God, this is seismic because the whole world thinks something wrong. So I said, are, are you sure? Are you certain? He said, well, what, what happened was when John came into the ER, Dr. Halloran was the main surgeon. He had two nurses assisting him, nurses Deatra Sato and nurses Barbara Cameron, which I'll get to in a moment. The first thing Deatra uh, Sato and Dr. Halloran did was, was they cut John's clothes off, which is standard procedure, and they turned him, looked on his back, turned him, looked on his front, checking the wounds. Deatra and Dr. Halloran, David Halloran, both are adamant that they saw four bullets just above his left heart in a tight professional grouping, very close together, and three bullets coming out of John's back in a direct line of fire. So there's no magic bullets moving around, going into thighs and wrists. Four in the front, three come out the back, one very near the shoulder stayed in, didn't come out. And they were adamant that this was the case. You then had a second nurse, Barbara Camera, came in to assist. She said she saw the same thing. So I said to Dr. Helen, I said, well, why didn't you you know, why didn't you say to the Lennon report that they were wrong? Because if you watch the Lennon report, they're talking about wounds in the back. And he said, well, we did try to say to them that that was wrong, um, but they wouldn't listen. <laughs> Interestingly, one of the nurses, Barbara Camera, a wonderful woman, she said um, she was actually, they started to argue with the producers of the Lennon report that they need to get this right, you know, four or three, and it, it was shot in front. And um, the writer said to Barbara, well, that's what Wikipedia said. You know, I'm just going by Wikipedia. And Barbara said, well, Wikipedia wasn't in the room that night. You know, yeah, we were in the room. We saw, we saw those wounds. So after I spoke to Dr. Halloran, I thought, right, I need more corroboration here. I'll try and find the nurses. So I managed to locate the nurses who were two wonderful, no-nonsense New York ladies who, you know, say it as it is. Just, you know, no BS. And I spoke to both of them. They both said, yep, 100% four in the front three out the back now what's interesting about these nurses is they were given the job of washing john and shrouding him after they called it and they couldn't save his life so about 45 minutes after they decided you know when he first came in they just couldn't save him anymore and and dr halloran called it they took him away they washed his wounds and they wrapped him in a shroud so these nurses got to see john's wounds without no mess and blood it was you know completely clear so that's you know, puts for me, their testimony, probably even more than Dr. Halloran's as crucial. For me, they're they're the best witnesses for John's medical condition. There was then an incredible thing happened after that. After they shrouded him, they got a visit to the hospital 
by the chief medical officer of New York at the time, a man called Elliot Gross. Now, I don't know if you guys ever watched Quincy and all those guys, but you know, these you know, chief medical officers often go to a crime scene. That's, that's quite normal to go to a crime scene and have a look around and see where the bullets are and stuff and see any blood on the ground, et cetera. But for a chief medical officer to go to a hospital, to an ER room, when they're going to receive the body in a few hours at their medical office is literally unheard of to the point where Elliot Gross, when he came into the ER, the nurses went, well, who the hell are you? And he said, well, I'm the chief medical officer. And they just wouldn't believe him. They were like, well, you can't be because the chief medical officer is about to get this body in a few hours time tomorrow morning. What, why are you here? So there was this real to and fro. And he said, I am the chief medical officer and I want to see John Lennon's wounds. Now, I find that highly suspicious that he was in a real hurry to see John's entry and exit wounds. So he insisted that they unshroud John, which they did. They sat in, he insisted that they sit him up. And I don't want to get too gruesome here, but he's starting to bleed out again and they're getting very angry. They found it quite disrespectful that he was doing this. Elliot Gross then walks around John's body silently for a minute, two minutes, doing this, and then he walks off. Not a word, walks out. And then we know he went into a police car back to the Dakota and he started to talk to some of the witnesses at the Dakota. In fact, he only spoke to one witness at the Dakota, the concierge, Jay Hastings, which is again, rather strange, but that's what he did. So thank goodness he did it. It was weird, it was suspicious, but it gave the nurses a second chance to see John's wounds close up. To look again. So if we're gonna go by what the nurses said, those who handled his body in a state of, when it was really messy with, blood and everything and then cleaned after they wrapped it and such and then had to take it out again. They were really yeah. in the best position to see the state of Lennon's body and the wounds. So would that 100%. mean that if he was shot here, kind of like in a professional hitman style manner with a clustering right here, which is a, a mm -hmm. mark of someone who's proficient and has done this before. Yeah. So that would suggest that someone was in front of Lennon as he was walking towards him and three of the bullets went through and out his back. Wouldn't they have been lodged in another building across from the Dakota? Was there any follow up on that or? Isn't that interesting? I mean, what, what's interesting about the bullets is, is there's, I mean, I've got the police reports. I've got the, the detective's notebooks. There's no mention of how many bullets were found. I've spoken to him about it. He said, yeah, we found some bullets, but you know, we, we're not, it, it's all very vague. The, the, I, I've seen some pictures of one bullet. I've seen some picture of three bullets. I've seen a picture of two bullets. We're not certain of how many bullets were found, but what we are certain of, and I ask people to go to, um, if you go to my Instagram assassination of Lennon or go to my YouTube assassination of Lennon, you will see some images of the glass vestibule door. These doors have got glass panels and in these glass panels are three bullet holes. There's two in one door, the door closest to John, the door that John almost certainly opened. But there's another glass vegetable door behind that door, which John couldn't see and Chapman couldn't see, that has another bullet hole in. And what's interesting about these bullet holes is they're very low down. So if they were the bullets that were passing through John, they would have been going through his hip or his stomach. They certainly weren't the bullets that were passing through his upper left chest, and his upper left back. These bullets are a complete mystery because what's really interesting about them, if you look at these images that have been pretty much suppressed, these images, because there was an AP photographer where you can see one, one image of it and you can see it from the back and you can see the two bullet holes quite clearly. And what's good about it is there's detectives standing next to it. So you get an idea where on the body these bullet holes would have came from. And there's one other image from behind the driveway where you get another angle, which the DA's office, to their credit, released on FOI. But that's it, two images. But uh, there's a t ITV producer I know called Kevin Sim, who I spoke to, who did a fantastic documentary in 1988 called The, Ma the Man Who Shot John Lennon. And, I, and in, that, in that documentary, there is a lot of different images of those bullet holes that Kevin managed to, managed to access. And I spoke to Kevin, I said, how did you get those images, Kevin? And he said, well, back in 88, he got an insider at the NYPD to give him those images. Uh, and they and they certainly they requested them officially and, and they were said no, but an insider managed to get them those images. And sadly, the stills from that insider have been lost. It was it was a and it, I, I, I used to work for ITV, which is the which is the company who produced that uh, documentary. And the ITV archive, sadly, in, in 88 wasn't set up to keep materials like that in storage, which is a real shame. So they were probably thrown away, which is absolutely heartbreaking. But what it does prove is that the NYPD did take crime photos 
and they're very keen for those crime photos not to be released to the public. And I think if anybody can tell me how those three bullet holes got there, I would be really grateful because I've tried to work out lots of different scenarios of yeah, the angles. Uh, yeah, the angles do not make any sense whatsoever. Wherever you put Chapman, they just don't make any sense. Yeah, because so Chapman would have been more closer to the entrance, like you were saying earlier, if you're looking at it from the front on the left side near where the, the doorman's little uh, box was. Um, and, and is it true? Did, did, did he go into a combat stance or was he just standing up? Like that's another detail that I feel like has been muddied over the last 43, nearly 43 years. He's never mentioned combat stance in the first 12 years of um, of his chit chat, of anything he said. The, the first time the combat stance came up was in a Barbara Waters, uh, Larry King interview, where he mentions in a very unconvincing manner that he went into a combat stance and shot John. Uh, I think at that point, Mark was parodying what people were saying, and he was basically parroting whatever he heard previously 12 years earlier. That was also the first time that Mark said that he shot John to acquire his fame, uh, which yeah. is something that Mark's never said he did before. Uh, if, if you read, uh, thank you for telling me about my Substack, Eric. If you go to my Substack, davidwheeland.substack.com, I, I posted an article today about Mark Chapman's initial first testimony, uh, which I think is the most important testimony of Mark Chapman because it was the one that he spoke 90 minutes after the murder before any hypnotists, any psychiatrists, any pastors came or in. Mil or Milton Klein. Milton Klein, yeah, the, the, the classic Milton. We'll get into him in a moment. So it's basically, Mark, I call it Mark Chapman Unplugged. This is what he felt just a few <clears> minutes <throat> after the murder. And he doesn't talk about combat stance. He talks about, again, he's convinced that he shot John in the back, something that he couldn't do, as far as I'm concerned. It's just impossible. If you consider Mark's 20, 20, 25 feet away from John, shooting over from left to right in the dark, um, it's, I spoke to Dr. Harron about this. He was used to seeing lots of different um, bullet wounds. And he's a very experienced surgeon. He said, in his opinion, not even a Navy SEAL could achieve that tight grouping from that distance with a 38 revolver. Now, a lot of people say, our oh, Mark must have turned. And, and that's, you know, he must have called out, uh, sorry, Lennon must have turned. Mark must have called out and Lennon must have turned. We know that's not true for two reasons. One, for three reasons. One, Mark has never said he called out to John Lennon, ever. Not even in 92, where I think he was being coerced. So Mark's never, ever said he called out to John. The second point, which is really important, Yoko Ono, and I have all of her statements, five of her statements, has never said that Chapman called out to her husband. In fact, she's never said that she saw Mark Chapman shoot her husband. I don't think she did. And she's, she did say in one of her first statements, which again, you can find on, on my Instagram, I've actually put the, I've posted up the notebook from the detective where she says it. She says quite clearly, we heard some noises in the street, but we did not turn around. So that's from Yoko Ono's own voice. Also, you've got Jay Hastings, the concierge, listening in the window, who could hear the Lennon's limo pull up and hear the door and hear the footsteps and hear the, and hear the, uh, the door, the vestibule door opening. He's never said that he heard Mark Chapman call out to, um, to John Lennon. So I don't think, in fact, I'm almost certain Mark Chapman did not call out to John and I'm almost certain John didn't turn, which means, and again, I didn't want to find this. It's kind of, I, I'm pretty certain John um, Chapman was groomed. I'm pretty certain he was coerced to do it possibly was hypnotized. In fact, I'm fairly certain he was. So I don't, I don't need a second shooter to be there for, for my, you know, for my theory. I'm quite happy for Chapman well, to take the rap. But right, right. He could he, have actually done. Yeah, exactly. He could have been wound up and sent there. And, and have you, have you ever read Sean Lennon's public statements from the nineties talking have, about I how I, I've been trying to find the link to that for, I, I remember reading that years ago. I know that I read it. I think it was yeah. in some kind of New York area publication or some, it was in the, it was in the New Yorker in 98. And he okay. said that he was convinced that the American government killed his father. And I think he's right. Well, actually, no, I'm not sure if he's right. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, we'll get into motive in a little while later, but I, I think the problem with when people try to point the finger at who was behind a, a nefarious act and generalize, is, yeah, they, they tend to be, oh, it was that group or it was that mm -hmm. guy or it was that. It, it, it's all very binary. It's black and white. It had to be them or it had to be them. I think with this, it was a combination of different people. I think it was a group of people who all had links to intelligence. They all had links to, uh, to Richard Nixon, I, I can. This is a route right back to Nixon. The people that I think were involved were, were wow. connected to Nixon. 
And I, I think it's, 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 I think it was possibly a bit of a Thomas Beckett kind of thing where, where they kind of like, you know, where you had Henry the first famously saying, was it Henry the second, you know, who will, who will get rid of this tiresome, you know, Bishop. And I just think I could see something like Nixon talking to some people who had the, you know, who had the capabilities or new people who had the capabilities who will get rid of this tiresome Lennon. Cause we know Lennon absolutely detested Nixon. Well, and we know Nixon absolutely they, detested Lennon. They were tapping his phones. I mean, in the seventies when they were trying to deport him, that there's a great documentary. I'm sure you've seen it. The U S versus John Lennon. Brilliant. That even yeah, goes right. into he, John in the seventies, um, not that he felt paranoid, but he was fairly certain that they were tapping his phones. And I think indeed it's come out that they were tapping his phones. They were the they had surveillance on him. He was considered a huge threat if he could galvanize an anti-war movement or a march or I mean a, a beetle. Just think about one beetle, the crowd they can put together. And I, I've read this too, and this was a nugget that I saw in uh, Bresler's book that I thought was interesting. I think it was either going to be a week later or the, or the following month. Lennon was due to fly out to California to participate in some kind of strike or workers' march or yes. some kind of activist activity. So if a group associated with Nixon or the far right or, or intelligence in our government or an offshoot saw that Lennon was indeed going to be coming out of retirement with his activism and his music, that could have been really bad for, for them as they came into power in 81 with uh, Reagan and Bush again. Yeah, correct. I, I think let's let's wind back a little bit to the start of 1980. What what happened in Hawaii in 1980 is we know Chapman became obsessed with the catcher in the rye. Totally out of the blue, bought the book, bought a copy for Gloria, started asking people to call him the catcher or Holden Caulfield. Now, if you listen to some friends that have come into the Mark Chapman story much later, uh, friends that I've been told by other friends that really knew Mark, didn't really know him that well. But some of these, I won't mention their names, but they, you know, let's call them the embellishers again. Some of these people have said that Mark was always obsessed about this book and he spoke to them about it when he was a, a child. This is not true. Um, what happened um, once the murder occurred, once Lennon was assassinated, a whole army of reporters went to Decatur and went to Mark Chapman's hometown and spoke to all his teachers and friends and family. Not one of those people said he had read Catcher, had spoke about Catcher. Mark was not interested in Catcher and I, but for some reason, at the start of 1980, that book became very important to him. Now, Catch is a very mysterious, strange book. If you look into, you know, Salinger and his life and the affiliations that he had with intelligence agencies, you know, he was basically a spy in World War II. He, well, he, he's a, he, he supposedly had the manuscript in his bag when he was running around over there fighting in the war, which was pretty crazy. Yeah, it's an interesting book. And obviously there's stories about that book. Was We know it was in Hinckley's hotel room when he tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan. There's reports that it was on Lee, Har Lee Harvey Oswald's bookshelf. I can't get that verified, but it's, it's possible. So for some reason, let's get back to that. So Chapman's obsessed with Catcher in the Rye in 1980. Another thing happened in August. Another book comes into John Lennon's life, which is uh, a, a book by, I forget the, the, the author's name now, One Day at a Time, I think it's called, where August suddenly John Lennon becomes the obsession. And not only John is Mark obsessed with Holden Caulfield and the phonies of this world, he's obsessed with John Lennon being a phony. So all the kind of capturing the rye stuff that's going on in his head is now suddenly in August been shifted towards John Lennon. And, and he said, this is where I started to get these compulsions and these feelings to kill John Lennon. Now I know for a fact Mark Chapman was seeing hypnotists in Hawaii at this time. I'm not gonna mention their names, but they're very nefarious, strange people and they will come out of my book. We know for a fact he was in psychiatric treatment and some of those psychiatric people that were treating him were also hypnotizing him. I know that for an absolute fact. So what happened then from August onwards is that the, the catcher starts to be fused with the Lennon phony narrative. And he becomes obsessed with trying to kill John Lennon from that point onwards. Two other things were going on in August, which is really interesting. One, that was the point where pretty much everybody knew Ronald Reagan was going to beat Jimmy Carter. And everyone knew that Reagan was going to be the main player for the next four years. Another interesting thing happened in August was that's when John went into a recording studio and started to record Double Fantasy. So if you were, let's just say, a nefarious entity that were trying to get a, man a, a very pliable, easily groomed Manchurian candidate to kill John Lennon, you'd probably trigger that in August 1980. And that's exactly what happened in Mark Chapman's life. He, he fused Catcher with Lennon the phony. And from that point onwards, if you listen to Chapman's own words, he felt compelled to carry out, as he calls it, his mission. And there was no way he could stop himself from doing this. To me, that just doesn't sound, uh, it doesn't sound right to me. It sounds like a, the obsession almost sounds like a compulsion. And it, to me, it also sounds like a suggestion that was implied into Mark Chapman. And I think Bresler was sure about this in 88, and I'm sure about it now that he was, if you were kind, groomed, 
to to be a kind of uh, a kind of Christian jihadi, perhaps. Um, but I think there's more to it. And I think if you want to line up the fact that he thought he was doing something that we're almost certain now he wasn't doing from the entrance and exit wounds and where Mark Chapman was placed. I hate to say it, but it sounds crazy, but I'm pretty much convinced now there was a second shooter somewhere in that, in that driveway. I think the second shoot was in the vestibule area. It could have been behind the vestibule area in the, in the door we couldn't see. He could have been on the stairway. He could even be across the driveway in a alcove, which again, couldn't be visible from the street. But it, that needs, what we need to do and what needs to happen is there needs to be a complete reconstruction of that driveway. There needs to be a complete reconstruction of the bullet holes, all the trajectories, where we know Chapman was, where we know Lennon was, and then we'll see what's possible and what's not, because that's not been done yet. That's that's exactly it, David. And before we were rolling, I told you how Mike and I visited the Dakota in 2000, March of 2002, Mike. Is that when we were there? And like going there, it's like when we went to Dealey Plaza. We've been to Dealey Plaza now twice. Uh, we went there only a couple months ago. Um, when you go there and actually see it in person, it's it's chilling and it's haunting. But um, there, I think you're, you're right, nail on the head there, David. There needs to be a complete like forensic accounting and a, a layout and a geographical layout like they've done with Dealey Plaza, like they've done with the Ambassador Hotel. And this is the kind of thing that led um, RFK Jr. He read the autopsy report and he looked at the layout and all the recreations. And, and it was Paul Schrade who was hit in the head in the RFK's shooting that said, you got to read the autopsy report and you got to look at the forensics of this case. And that, that changed RFK Jr.'s mind to really, really take a hard look at the case. And now he's calling for Sirhan to be released and does not believe Sirhan was the actual trigger man who killed his father. So um, that's certainly earth shattering and paradigm shifting for a lot of people. Um, mm. To see the, the namesake of RFK having the courage to public, first of all, to go and face this because yeah. like for us, you know, our parents passing away is, is, traumatic and horrifying and sad and a terrible thing none of us wants to face. Um, but just imagine that happens to you and, and it's done in such a violent and, and shocking way and it's playing out in front of the entire world. Mm. So it, it, it just, it takes it and, and puts it into a stratosphere that normal people, or anyone, how could you even comprehend it? Um, but I just, I just feel like people are like ready for this information and, and, and ready to hear and ready for it to have its day. Um, because like I told you before we were rolling, man, I started looking at your stuff and just the, the bullets, uh, it was like shocking to me because yeah, I, I just felt like, yeah, man, you got hit. In the, I've always heard you got hit in the back and there's not really anything more to it, but all you got to do is do a little digging and, and look into the, some of the forensics of it and the statements of the people who handled uh, Lennon's body, um, the eyewitnesses, um, it, well, we can get whole... into that. Yeah, we, we can get into the eyewitnesses if you want. I mean, it, some of them are. We've got time, guys. Are you right? Of course. Time? Yeah. No, yeah. we got. Yeah, we got. We got time. Man, this is the this is the Jackman show. We say how much time we got. Excellent. Um, excellent. I, I I think it's interesting you brought up the autopsy. Um, the autopsy was conducted by Elliot Gross. We know the the guy who turned up at the hospital the night before. Um, what's interesting about Elliot Gross is he's had multiple accusations of falsifying autopsy for the NYPD. And I, we need to state for the record, none of those stuck. He, he got off those charges. But he did lose his office after those charges and he went to another office where there were other accusations where again teflon elliot managed to get off those accusations and he kept he kept on staying in employment until in the end i think he ran out of road and there was just too many accusations against him and he he no longer practiced so that we've got a sort of that autopsy has not been released to the public because Yoko Ono needs to give permission. In the New York State, the, the law is that the family must give permission for a, a private medical record like an autopsy to be released to the public, which is totally understandable. There's a lot of private you know, medical details on there. But what's interesting is we've got a pretty good idea what might be on that autopsy because Elliot Gross did a press conference uh, after the day he, he uh, uh, um, you know, conducted the autopsy. And Elliot said that there was two in the back and two in the shoulder. So it's pretty... Well, going by that, it sounds like it's pretty official that, you know, Elliot's going kind of with the back. He's not really moving too much. Now, I personally wouldn't put too much faith in anything that Elliot Gross comes up with with regards to autopsy results. But interestingly, there's a death, death certificate that Elliot Gross has issued, which you can find online, which has been released. And in that one, Elliot says that John suffered chest wounds. So it's whether you go with the death, death certificate with the chest wounds or you go with the autopsy with the back wounds. 
with Elia, you just, you know, you, you take your pick really which way you want to go with it. And that death certificate, though, it has not been authenticated, right? Or, or do you no, it has? It has? It, I, I think, it, no, no, certainly Elliot Gross has not said it's from me. It okay. looks pretty, it looks pretty genuine to me. The signatures look pretty authentic. Um, no one has said it's not John Lennon's death certificate uh, mm. and proved otherwise. So it's just I not 100% verified. No, no, we can't okay. say it's verified. But I think, and, you know, same with the autopsy. I think, and what's, oh, this is a really important point. The night that Dr. Haller and the nurses tried to save John Lennon's life, they, they made out at that night what's called an ER report. And on the ER report, they do a little stick drawing of a front uh, guy and a back of a guy. And on there, Dr. Haller and the nurses both confirmed to me that they put the four entrance wounds and the three exit wounds on the back. And they made lots, lots of copious notes about where John was shot and where the bullets went through and the one that got stuck. That report went missing that night and no one has ever found it since. Now, coupled with that, David, there's been no public crime report released by like the NYPD or anything like that, right? No, none at all. There's been lots of requests. Um, I don't think a crime report happened. In fact, I'm absolutely, I mean, I've got most of the, the lead detective's paperwork. There's no forensics on that. I asked him about forensics. He said, why would you need forensics? You know, we had our guy, you know, what, what was the point? Um, I asked him about fingerprints. No, didn't do fingerprints. You see the gun. When the cops got there, there was no gun. So what, what happened with the gun is, if you listen to what Mark Chapman said on the night of the murder, which is the most important statement that Mark Chapman ever made, he said that after he shot John, he didn't know what happened to the gun because all he was holding was the catcher in the eye book. He assumed that Jose Padermo kicked the gun, his gun, though he doesn't know he had a gun, to the back of the driveway. Now, what's interesting about that is, there's a guy, a lift operator called Joseph Manny, who was in the basement of Dakota at the time when, when the shooting happened. Joe Manny said he heard three bullets. He came up in a lift with two, with two co-workers. And Jose Padermo was pacing at the back of the driveway near the vestibule doors around the gun. And Jose Padermo said to Joe Manny, take that gun, take it downstairs so this guy can't shoot it. So Joe Manny then picked the gun up took it downstairs into the basement and put it in a drawer. By the time the cops turned up, Mark Chapman had no gun on him. Now, what's really interesting about Mark Chapman and that gun is Mark doesn't ever recall pulling the hammer. He doesn't recall aiming, but he does remember thinking, isn't it strange that my bullets are working? Which is again, not the kind of thing that a cold calculated assassin would think. And he doesn't even remember after he allegedly shot John, having a gun in his hand. So you've then got to start to ask yourself, did he even have a gun in his hand? Um, if, you, if it went to court, the chain of evidence on that gun was broken many, many times. Then you've got to ask yourself, why did Jose Padermo not pick the gun up himself? Why did he kick it and why did he wait for someone else? At this point, Mark is docile reading a book by, by the roadside. So what, what is Jose worried about? And why did Jose Padermo not want to get his prints on that gun? It's very, very strange. And, and is it true that he said, do you know what you just did? What, what is, that, got, is that in question too? Because that's another yeah, one you always hear. You hear that I, one a lot, you, you know? If you, go, if you go with Chapman, he never said he said that uh, in, in the early testimony that Chapman gave after the murder. So that, that doesn't come up at all. I do know that we are, I've got a secondary witness who I won't reveal who they are at this point, but they came on the scene seconds after gunfire. And they heard Jose Padermo pleading with Chapman to get out of the area. And they even heard, heard, heard Jose Padermo say, the cops are going to be here soon. Get out of here. Now, mm. to me, this is a guy who doesn't have a gun on him, remember. There's no gun. This witness didn't see a gun. Why is Jose in such a hurry for Mark to run away from the scene when he's docile reading a book? I, I, I don't understand what his motive was there it's very it puts it for me it puts a big question mark over jose padermo for sure but getting back to the investigation one didn't occur because i've spoken to the concierge i've spoken to joe manny i've spoken to people who worked at the dakota and they've all said that the next day the janitors came in mopped up the blood in the concierge's office they then opened up the driveway and people started to come in to the hotel, not the hotel, into the Dakota, and business was as usual. The detectives were gone. There was no forensics in white suits. There was no fingerprints. 
the whole thing just almost didn't happen. And you just think, how is that even possible on, you know, when one of the most famous men who ever lived, um, you know, was murdered and they didn't bother to investigate it. It's I think within, they can say within the shock and the grief that they were just like, everyone was so shocked and, uh, you know, aggrieved and just in a state of, uh, you know, almost in a, like a, a catatonic state, you know, that, that, that I could see how that could just get swept under the rug amid all that, like the coverage of the crowds gathering and singing outside the Dakota, um, the world, you know, the, the vigils. And so I, yeah. I mean, I don't know, but I, I agree with what you're saying. But I, I'm trying to think, like, officially what someone might say to counter that. Uh, probably, you know, oh, this is an open and shut case. We know who did it. Another thing I could never square, and I I, I don't know if, the, you know, these were still there or, or they were, like, I don't know if they were po big concrete potted plants. But supposedly Chapman had a copy of Double Fantasy that he had Lennon sign, and then he threw it up onto a, a potted plant or a pot that was, like, 12 or 15 feet above the ground or something like that. What's, what's the story on that? Did you look into that at all? Yeah. The, 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 the album was found by a, a guy called Philip Michaels uh, in that plant pot, which is again, very high above the gold, the gold, uh, the gold doorman's booth. I can't quite figure out why it was put up there. And I can't quite figure out why Philip Michael um, bothered to, 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 to look up there. It's, it's very, very strange, but I think with regards to, that album we we know that chapman had it on him we know he had it signed but we also know that paul goresh had albums as well that he handed into the police uh which were um very um uh which is very strange because he said that he had chapman's prints on it so you thought well, what why paul did you bring a did you bring a job lot to the dakota that day yeah he's did, got photos of him too with lennon that, yeah. that famous gr that grim photo of of, Le of chapman looking at lennon signing his album yeah, it's it's it, it makes no the Paul Goresh story again. I've I've written about Paul Goresh on my Substack. Paul Goresh is not, I think, what he claims to be. I think there's something not quite right there uh, with with regards to Paul and the convenience that he had a he had a bunch of d double fantasy albums on him, and he just happened to get that picture that made him a very rich man that night. So it's it, it is very very bizarre. I don't know if you guys can you hear my dog guys. He's going nuts here. Are you no. guys all right? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. I just hope you can't hear him. He's he's uh, I don't know what spooked him, but yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, no, no worries. Yeah, Paul Goresh, you, you write about him on your Substack. Um, he he is an interesting figure. So for people who haven't heard of him, kind of talk about why he is significant, who he portrayed himself to be, and what what kind of raised red flags to you about him. Oh, can I just quickly just can you just yeah. bear me one second? Yeah, yeah, go, go, go take second. care of the. No, that's fine. Yeah, Pucci. Yeah, so I'll, I I'll, I need to grab some water too. I'll, I'll sure. be right back. Sure, I'll go through some chats here while we're waiting. Jose says, I'll check this out later. This has been a rabbit hole. I've wanted to go on till I found out the dude who did it. Uh, his wife is still married to him. Fire Pixie says, hello. Hello, Fire Pixie. Thank you for tuning in. It's uh, great to have you here on the live stream. Um, IB Denmark, thanks for joining us. Fire Pixie, thanks for joining us. Al Francis. Al, thanks for tuning in. I know I'm sure this is probably pretty wild for you to hear. Um, our buddy Al Francis uh, was part of a very popular Beatles tribute band here in the States called Studio Two, and he played Paul. And he's a Beatles fanatic like we are, so he's enjoying this convo. Paul, uh, Al, thanks for tuning in. I'll call you Paul. Paul or Al, I don't know where it ends and where it begins. Um, and P1 Dizzy is watching. Thank you. Um, Okay, so yeah, you, you were sorry back in the room. Talking. Oh yeah, no, is Pucci okay? Pucci's okay. He, he's a strange dog. He's a he's a crazy spaniel who uh, <laughs> tends to go crazy sometimes for no reason at all. But yeah, he's all good. He's okay, all good. so you were beginning to talk about um, the guy who took the photos. Yes, Paul Goresh. Paul Goresh. Yeah, yeah. Paul's Paul's interesting. He's an interesting man. He handed in. Um, a double fantasy album to the NYPD that, that I think probably the next day and said, uh, it might have Mark Chapman's prints on it, which again, it's just very odd that this story is now coming up because I've got the police inventory record. So I know everything that's, that was handed into the police at the time, evidence wise. Um, Paul was a collector. He was, he was a Lennon stalker. There's no other word to call him. He, Lennon had a lot of problems with Paul Goresh. Uh, he, the story that Paul Goresh wanted people to know was that 
you know, him and John were great friends and they kind of hung out together and had coffee. It, nothing can be further from the truth. Um, Paul, John basically put up with, with Paul Goresh stalking him. Paul managed to blag his way into John's apartment or very close to his apartment. Uh, made out he was a TV repairman when he wasn't. He had an extensive Beatles John Lennon memorabilia collection, which I suspect uh, the Double Fantasy signed album would have been a nice addition for Paul. Um, I think he he kind of saw John as a way of making more money, to be honest with you. I'm sure he was a fan, no question about that. But I think he was there, uh, he wasn't there as John's friend. I think he was there trying to get another shot that, you know, might uh, might make him more money. And obviously that, it's just very convenient that he just happened to be there. I don't think there's anything nefarious here, but it's just very odd that he just happened to be there and got that shot of Mark and John together. And it's I think it's very suspicious that he had he had his own copy with him Paul Goresh at the time, and why was Chapman's prints on it? it, it I, I can't figure out what's going on there at all. Right, that that cheesy made-for-TV thing that came out, I'm sure you've seen that of um, the reenactment with Lennon, like, oh, you know, you can't just come up to me, you know, I'm just a regular guy, you know, here, you know, we can walk with me for a little bit, and it's like, he became buddy-buddy with him, and that, that whole story just seems fictitious. If, yeah, if, yeah. if you talk to people who are in the Dakota, <clears throat> Fred Seaman, Michael Medeiros, People who worked with John and Yoko at the time, it, it, Paul Goresh was a, was a problem. And, you know, right. Fred Seaman saw him as a security threat. Uh, John described him in very unsavory terms often. John attacked him once, and this is apparently on camera, and, you know, tried to grab his camera and destroy his camera. So Goresh was a pest. But he was it's invasive, yeah. He was invasive, but he's it's, it's kind of, you know, it's just, again, one of these Lennon stories where it's just been recalibrated as lovable Paul. And what the real strange thing about Paul Gresh is once John had died, Yoko decided to use one of his shots of John and Yoko walking out of the Dakota driveway, the very driveway where John was killed as a post John Lennon murdered single on watching the wheels. <clears throat> uh, so what, what, what is the thought process there? It's just absolutely bizarre how she wanted to, you know, commemorate John's death by putting his location of his death on a single. I, I, I just can't. But, but it's interesting we brought Yoko up, actually. I, I don't think Yoko Ono, I should state this, I don't think Yoko Ono was involved in her husband's murder at all. No, uh, no. I just don't, is any evidence for that? I think if she did want to bump her husband off, there's a lot easier way she could have done it than uh, have a guy firing a gun in a you know, small contained area. What, what's difficult about Yoko is, is she has given lots of different statements about where she was when she got out of the limo. And I'd love to know definitively where she was after gunfire started to ring out. Um, it, it's still unclear. Uh, it, so, as I say, some, some testimony, she says she was out front. Some testimony, she was behind John. In another one, they were kind of doing this. She was in front, he was in front, and they were changing positions and that's impossible in such a small driveway um so it'd be nice to have a definitive statement from yoko and i i think you know you know you, if every kind of assassination has a kind of catchphrase you know behind the grassy knoll or whatever i think with the lennon one it might be where was yoko because mm. if you go through her statements it's not clear but what she doesn't say and she's never said for 42 years is that she saw mark chapman shoot her husband she didn't see mark's bullets hitting John. So I find that very interesting. Yeah. And she also used his bloody glasses for either an album or some anti-gun campaign. Um, and that was, I mean, you know, it's, it's her right to do that. Uh, but I always thought that was kind of weird. To, it was crass. To, it was crass. It was crass. I mean, if, if you want to do an anti-gun campaign, post a great. I, I get yeah, it. I, sure. It should be done. It should be. But she used it on an album to sell music, her music. Hmm. And that, that's the bit I think that was wrong. I think, if you know, make a statement about anti-gun if that's what you want to do. But don't use your husband's bloodstained glasses to sell your album. Hmm. Uh, she, she may call it art, you know, who am I to say? And she may have called it an artistic statement. Um, I, I was very uncomfortable about that. And I think it was misjudged. But I still don't think she had anything to do with her husband's murder. I'm, I'm convinced yeah. about that. Yeah. So um, obviously, David, you worked kind of in the you worked for ITV, you said, right over mm -hmm. uh, in, in England. And you've worked in the entertainment world, the, the film world kind of thing. Yep. So yep. what uh, kind of reception are you getting from associates, colleagues, friends, family, you know, mm -hmm. other people, obviously, who are fans. And what, mm -hmm. uh, what are you getting from people? 
It's a really good question. Um, I think when I first started out in the TV industry in the 80s, um, documentaries would only be made if you had something to say. If you had an angle, if you did an investigation, if you had something to reveal to the public. Otherwise, in those days, you'd be, what's the point? Whereas I think now documentaries are made to be very glossy, uh, wonderful archive, really cool music, very cool edits. But I've never seen a documentary for some time now on the, in the mainstream media. There's plenty of the independent stuff going on. But in the mainstream media, I've never seen a documentary where I've gone, oh, I didn't know that before. Wow, I've just learned something really seismic there. It just, it tends to be, this guy's a bad guy. Here's a documentary about him. This organization's a bad organization. Yeah. Here's a documentary about it. It's like, yeah, but I knew that. It told me something I don't know. When I, talk, when I first spoke about this um, project to people, th th I think the problem with the TV and film industry at the moment with this kind of material, they're all terrified of that phrase. You know, the, you know the phrase I'm talking about, the one that you know, begins with C and, and the other one begins with T. And they are absolutely terrified of being called a conspiracy theorist. And, and when you say those words, I've seen hardened documentary filmmakers, journalists bristle with fear. I can see it in their eyes. If they, got, if they ever get called that phrase, they see their career almost evaporating in front of their eyes. And I think that to me is cowardice. And I think that's basically what's going on here. It's cowardice. They don't want to be accused of being conspiracy theorists. So anything, luckily I've managed to get beyond that. And I'm very optimistic that my documentary will come out as I want it to come out. But I'm also realistic enough to know that editorially, uh things can change a lot before things hit the screen and what's interesting about the young people coming up today in working in tv is when i discuss this with them uh, you know people in their teens and early 20s they um they seem to think that a conspiracy in any historical event is an impossibility that they seem to be as if like well yeah you're telling me about a lot of anomalies here but we just haven't worked out how to get past those anomalies yet. I'm sure we'll work it all out. We just haven't worked it out yet. They, they can't make that leap to think that nefarious things can happen with regards to historical events. So I think we're in a, but then again, you've got guys like yourself and you've got independent, you know, producers and content makers out there who are putting stuff out regardless, high quality stuff like yourselves, you know, who are, breaking through with open minds and, and, and letting people like myself Thank have you. a platform. And, and, and this is so, and I hope, what, what I hope will happen is, is guys like you will start to break into the mainstream and we'll start to get your ideas and your open mindedness into the mainstream. I'm not convinced it will happen as quickly as I think it needs to happen. But um, yeah, the industry needs to start to be a bit braver about, you know, addressing contentious issues and allowing people to have a voice outside of the official narrative, it's, it's, it's long overdue. I agree. Thank you for your, for your kind words, David. I appreciate that. And kind of to echo what you were saying, you, you, you can be afraid of, of that smear uh, and that label coming from friends and sometimes even family. And I've certainly been laughed at and mocked and dismissed, um, but I've held firm on a lot of on stuff that I've been talking about for nearly 20 years. And when some people are finally willing to actually give it a fair shake and look at it, they're like, oh, my God, man, what you were trying to tell me about all those years ago, that was actually true. Or I discovered something else about that. And, um, yeah, I just, you know, I, I don't claim to have any kind of um, uh, the absolute truth about any of this stuff. But I, I will yeah. always question, Ask you know, questions. narrative. I'm always willing to question stuff and have an open discussion about it. And we can agree yeah. and disagree on stuff. And I think to your point with the media and, you know, younger folks not – you know, in the mainstream, not willing to go there. So much of the content now is so bad and so boring and people are tired of it. Um, and I think there is uh, a real hunger for this type of information. So um, I know, I think you mentioned this in your Substack. you did try to reach out to Mark David Chapman and you were kind of, what happened with that? Were you trying to get him like, cause he's only given yeah. what, three or four interviews in the last 30 years, 35 yeah, he gave, years. He gave two big interviews to, uh, to Barbara Waters and Larry King in 92. Uh, under the auspice of uh, a journalist called Jack Jones, who wrote a book about him in '92, um, and he's done no other. He's done a few things with some religious people, um, mainly along religious lines. Um, 
so yeah he's for a guy who killed john lennon to become famous he's not really seeked fame that's for sure right. yeah I yeah i tried to, yeah very weird I, I tried to get to him uh, if you want to get to mark you've got to go through gloria and there's another person who again i'm going to keep nameless for now who basically tells gloria what to do and uh and that guy is a very interesting guy who i'm looking forward to uh about revealing to the world but basically look, looking forward to finding more about let's put it that way but yeah so basically gloria and another man basically control all access to to mark and mark listens to what they say 24 7. so if you want to get to mark you've got to go through these people i did approach gloria about a year ago um i sent her an email maybe two years ago now yeah two years ago and uh i said to her, like, i'm a tv producer i'm working on a documentary I'm working on a book about your husband there's a lot of anomalies that i found in your husband's case um can we have a discussion off the record just trying to build a bridge to her and what she did was she emailed me back a couple of weeks later and said that she discussed my uh request with mark which i never asked her to do uh and she after a lot of prayer and, and hard thought they decided not to talk to me which I found as a kind of, she was basically saying, I'm not interested. And in, if you want to get to Mark, you got to go through me. Um, so that's fine. That's up to her. Um, I mean, Gloria's, Gloria's a very interesting woman. I, I still have a lot of questions I'd like to ask Gloria. And one of the key questions I'd like to ask Gloria is how she managed to talk to Mark Chapman in the uh, 20th Precinct Police Station at 2.50 in the morning, uh, 10 minutes before his name was officially released uh, to the press. Uh, so you think in a pre-internet age, I just can't figure out how Gloria managed to not only find out that her husband committed this murder, but how to find the police station that he was being held in and then find the phone number and the protocols to ring to actually get through to talk to Mark. And if you listen to the statement of a, a Lieutenant Arthur O'Connor, who was there in the police station that, that, that night, is the chief of the police station that night, he has been quoted as saying that when that phone call came through, he thought there was a conspiracy. Wow. Now so there's that, questions to ask Gloria for sure. Oh yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like they haven't really been asked in, in the past. And every time the anniversary comes up, you get the same old stuff trotted out, the same old narratives, uh, what they, what they do with the fans and the same talking heads. Um, have you tried to speak? It sounds like you've you've talked to people who worked at the Dakota, and obviously yeah. you've talked you've talked to these nurses. Have have you tried to talk to anyone from the Lennon camp or the, the Beatles camp? Yeah, or any yeah, yeah. I have. I've spoken to a few um, Lennon Beatles. Well, let's say Beatles insiders first. Uh, the Beatles insiders all think Yoko did it. That I've spoken to, uh, and I just think it's they're not really thinking logically. They just have a dislike of Yoko from back oh, in the day. Wow. I think they see Yoko as someone who. You know just got their claws into john and she went after john for money which i don't know maybe she did maybe she didn't but there's there's not a lot of love for yoko inside the beatles camp that i've found but there may be other people who like her but the people i spoke to have no time for her and some are absolutely convinced that she's somehow involved but they've got no proof of that wow. just, I, I think the, they get, it's like, it's like kurt the, cobain think who people who yeah. think courtney love was involved they're kind of yeah. They have emotion. It's a, they're thinking emotionally. They're, they're not right. really thinking log logically. The people inside the Dakota, I've spoken to Fred Seaman, I've spoken to Michael Medeiros, uh, who both worked at the Dakota at the time with John and Yoko. Uh, again, not a lot of love for Yoko, um, but Fred's had his but own issues. With they all think Yoko. it was just Chapman, though? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. I, I think because the medical stuff has been covered up for so many years, and because when, when Dr. Halloran came out with the nurses in 2011, the press didn't really do their job properly and put two and two together. Um, it, it's, it's people just are totally unaware of, I mean, a lot of people think he was shot on the pavement as he got out of the car. Some people thought he was shot, you know, on the cobblestones leading up to the vestibule. Nobody has actually really tried to figure out exactly where he was shot. And that's really interesting because I'm pretty certain he was shot in the vestibule. If you go to my YouTube channel and, and put in assassination of Lennon, the lead detective, Ron Hoffman, says on a clip on that on that channel, this is about an hour after the murder outside the hospital. He says quite clearly, he's told me this as well, by the way, on a recorded interview, that John Lennon was shot inside the vestibule. And that's wow. where the that's where the police cordon was. I, I've had a conversation with him where he says he thought he was shot on the stairway inside the vestibule. Now, there's no way Mark Chapman, unless he's got bullets that can <laughs> swerve and swerve magically. Yeah. Unless he's John Wick. You know, 
Oh, a bit of Matrix stuff, maybe. Yeah. He just, he just can't do that. He can't. He couldn't. He couldn't have done it. And what's what's really shocking is, even when I'm discussing this with Ron today, he he doesn't because he didn't really do a proper job and investigate it properly. He still can't really see the anomaly, um, and he still he hasn't quite figured out in his mind that John can't be shot in the back out in the driveway if he was shot inside the vestibule. Um, so. If, if you, there's also a secondary witness called Sean Strube who um, turned up and had a chat with Jose Padermo. In fact, he, he said the doorman told him this, that John was shot in the vestibule. So we know that's where John was shot. And if you also remember what the concierge Jay Hastings said, he said he heard the door open first. Then he, then heard, he, heard, then he heard shots. Then he heard shots. So think I'm it's pretty certain. Sorry. Oh, go on. Sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. Do you think it's true that James Taylor actually heard the shots from several blocks away? There's two James Taylor stories. He bumps into Chapman outside the subway the day of or the day before. Um, and then he says that he actually heard the shots because he was staying nearby. I, I think there might have been. Uh, it's really interesting that I, I think the second Chapman thing is a little bit like the second Oswald. There's a book about a second Oswald floating about and. There's a high possibility there might have been a second Chapman because there's a cab driver that I've spoken to called Mark Snyder, who's convinced that Chapman was in the back of his cab talking about working with the Beatles and working with John Lennon. And he offered Snyder some drugs. And he said when he got out of the cab, he rather dubiously said, remember my name, I'm Mark Chapman. Mm. I'm not sure I believe Mark Snyder, but it is very convincing. You've then got James Taylor saying that he's convinced that Chapman, you know, the day before accosted him in the subway. But you've also got a third guy, Ed Opperman now, who has said that, you know, the, the, the podcast guy, Ed Opperman, he said that he saw Chapman at the Yippie Centre uh, the, the day before John Lennon was shot. And it was a guy who looked just like Mark Chapman. So you've got three people in New York who all say that they saw a kind of crazed, aggressive Mark Chapman looking guy who came into their orbit. So... I've got no proof of it, but it's, I mean, Mark Chapman has said he wasn't in that cab. Mark Chapman has never mentioned seeing James Taylor and he's never mentioned being at the Yippie headquarters, but these people are all quite convincing. Yeah. So either Mark Chapman was potentially having some kind of psychotic episode and he was in another kind of personality doing these things, or there may have been a guy who looked just like Mark Chapman at that particular time telling people he was Mark Chapman. It's it's one of those mysteries that does need to be looked further into for sure. And then I read too, David, that uh, supposedly John Yoko and Mark David Chapman had tickets to see David Bowie perform in the Elephant Man the next day on the ninth mm -hmm. in the front row. Is that actually true? Did you? Let, that sounds too, no. too outrageous to be true. No, there's no proof of that at all. I mean, there, there was a lot of talk that Bowie was on the hit list, which now, thankfully, I've managed to I've get hold of in. I've heard that too. Hoffman's yeah, I've got Ron Hoffman's paperwork now, and the hit list was in the paperwork. I've now posted that to the world. Bowie's not on the list. You know, he wasn't on the list. So poor old David Bowie at the time really beefed up with security, and he was deeply concerned about his life and his security. Must have spent a fortune because of this so-called hit list that he was on. He's not on the hit list. And I don't think mm -hmm. Mark Chapman had tickets to see David Bowie. It's just one of those legends. that grew. I'd love to know who wrote that hit list. I don't think Mark Chapman wrote it. Yeah, I've never seen it. I've just read about it. I've never seen the actual original source for it, um, you know, because it's just one of those things, man, that along the way that just gets kind of glommed on to the, to the story yeah. that you hear about. It's iconic. It's iconic. The DA's office talked about it. I think a psychiatrist mentioned it. One of the do let, We can talk about the psychiatrist <laughs> now. It's a nice segue into the interesting psychiatrist who got to see Mark Chapman. Um, but, yeah, one of the psychiatrists mentioned that he had a hit list. But, again, there was no proof at the time. The, the piece of paper that I've got, which you can find on my Instagram, um, Assassination of Lennon, it, it, you know, it just says hit list at the top and then it's got five or six names. It looks like an eight year old wrote it. I mean, why, why would you put hit list? It, it, it right. makes no sense. It, it, it's nonsensical, totally nonsensical. It's, it's garbage. I, it, I'm, I'm not sure it's true. But let's, let's get into the psychiatrist because this is a really important part that I think we need to try and get to today if we've got time. Yeah. What happened yeah. when, when, when Mark, um, when Mark, was arrested and uh, he was being assessed. The first lawyer, public lawyer he got was a lawyer called Herbert Adlerberg, uh, real, real old school lawyer, old guy who um, wasn't really up for the job. And, it, and then the clips that you see of him, he's kind of quite, he's quite harassed and he was allegedly quite scared about all the Lennon fans that might attack him for defending Mark Chapman. Um, there were some death threats that came through allegedly and he decided to bail after two days. Then you got a second lawyer that came in, a guy called Jonathan Marks. Who's a very interesting man. Now, Jonathan Marks worked out of 30 Rockefeller Plaza. Now, Rockefeller Plaza in New York at the time was a very expensive, plush 
uh, building. Uh, so he was doing quite well for a kind of defense lawyer doing pro bono work, working out of this office, but that was his address. I've verified that a few times. Now, Jonathan Marks, the first thing he did was he decided to put in some psychiatrists to evaluate Mark Chapman, which is pretty standard procedure. Uh, and then the DA's office did the same. And you could imagine that, the, you know, the, pros the prosecution who were going for a temporary insanity uh, plea would have tried to say that Mark was insane. And, and a lot of the psychiatrists did say that. And the, the DA's office who were going for he was a sane, obviously all their psychiatrists came in and said, oh, he's sane. It's, it's almost laughable how the psychiatrists just say what the people who are paying him want them to say. But what was interesting about the defense psychiatrists who went in to see Mark Chapman, three of these dudes, Richard Bloom, Milton Klein, and Bernard Diamond are all very interesting characters. So, so let's, let's start with Let's start with Bernard Diamond. Now, Bernard Diamond was a psychiatrist, but he was also a hypnotist. And we first got to know about Bernard Diamond because he managed to be hired to assess uh, Siran Siran, uh, which is an amazing coincidence that this guy turns up uh, to uh, assess a, a murderer in two very interesting Manchurian candidate potential cases. Um, Bernard Diamond famously got uh, Siran Siran almost as a kind of circus party trick to climb his prison cells uh, as, as a monkey. And he was kind of showing off to the people that were in the room with him, look, I can make him do this under hypnosis. And he got Siren Siren to do it. Interestingly, when Mark Chapman was being held at Rikers Island, he started to climb his prison cell like a monkey, which is a very strange, interesting uh, parallel. You just sort of wonder whether Bernard was uh, up to his old uh, party tricks again. We don't know. But who's, what's even more interesting than Bernard Diamond is a guy called Milton Klein. And Milton Klein was put in there very early on. So we're talking about a week in. He was... Um, Jonathan Marks actually went to the New York Post and actually told the world that he was going to put this hypnotist into Mark's cell, this guy called Milton Klein, who was going to hypnotize Mark and try and get into his mind and figure out, you know, what Mark actually did and why he did it. What Jonathan Marks didn't tell the New York Post and what wasn't actually revealed until Fenton Bresler's book came out was that Milton Klein was a CIA consultant on the MK Ultra program, which was a program that was actually had lots of nefarious offshoots but one of the main uh objectives of mk ultra was to actually get an mk ultra uh, manchurian candidate to actually become a brainwashed assassin the guy that the cia went to, to to actually invent and create a manchurian candidate was milton klein absolutely incredibly milton klein was their guy in 79 you can find a clip of this milton klein did a documentary this is a year before jonathan marks put milton into into mark's cell he did a documentary with ABC where Milton Klein is on this documentary. And again, you can find this on my YouTube channel. It's very easily found, this clip. It's quite it was widely spread. That he, he felt confident that he could create a Manchurian candidate who would commit murder in just a few months. That he could actually, he had those skills to do that. So you need to sort of put yourself in a place where Mark Chapman is in a place where he's saying he's doing something that he can't physically do. So we can kind of say that potentially he's under some kind of hypnotic spell. And then you then get waltzing into his prison cell, unmonitored, you know, no independent assessor, total free time, come in and shut the door and do what you like with Mark. Milton Klein, a man that the CIA hired to create a Manchurian candidate. Now you could say that's just a pure coincidence, but for me, that's a coincidence that is so stark so troubling it, it can't be easily ignored but then i started to ask myself the question why would the defense put in these nefarious characters because richard bloom is another hypnotist who had links to, to the military so what why put in all these psychiatrists slap hypnotists who potentially were doing something dodgy we don't know for sure why would the defense do that i, I can't figure out if if there were nefarious entities trying to get these guys into chapman's cell surely that's not going to be easy through the defense team of Jonathan Marks. So then I started to look into Rockefeller Plaza. And what I realized in, in, in um, Rockefeller Plaza, there was another law firm working out of there called Donovan Leisure Newton and Irving. And Donovan stands for Wild Bill Donovan. And Donovan Leisure Newton and Irving, I've got to, I always forget the name of that company. That was basically the CIA's law firm. And not only was it the CIA's law firm, but it had William Colby, the ex-director of the CIA, who actually worked there. It was wall to wall with ex-CIA guys. And that was in the same building that Jonathan Marks was working out of. But it gets worse. Jonathan Marks had an assistant 
This assistant was called David Suggs, and David Suggs worked for Donovan, Leisure, Newton and Irving. So you basically had a CIA law firm with a CIA um, employee working for Mark Chapman's defense team. Now, I'm not saying that Jonathan Marks or David Suggs nefariously were working for the CIA and Donovan Legend and putting in these dodgy guys to mess with Mark Chapman's mind, but you can easily see how potentially David was offered up these people that he then offered up to Jonathan and Jonathan then um, you know, unwittingly puts these guys into Mark Chapman. So I'm not pointing the finger at anyone here, but if you want to find a link onto how Milton Klein got himself into Mark Chapman's police cell, it's very easy to find. It came from it came from Donovan, Newton, Leisure, and Irving. It came from David Suggs. It came through Jonathan Mark, and they went. They were main lines straight into Mark Chapman's cell. And what happened then? And what's really important about this is they were going for a temporary uh, insanity plea after Mark had all this free time of all these guys. In June 1981, he rings up Jonathan Marks. Mark does and says, "I don't want a trial." The, the trial of the century, which would have put Mark at the heart of one of the biggest trials of all time. To exactly. Get he decided to give all that up because he heard a voice in his head saying, plea guilty. This mm -hmm. is after he said, you know, untold time with Bernard Diamond, Milton Klein and various others, various other hypnotists. It could have been any one of them that could have said to Mark, Mark, you don't want to plead in a, you know, you, you want to plead guilty, do it for God, which is what he said he did it for. Very simple to do, very easy to do. Uh, there's no proof of this, of course, because these guys did audio tapes, which they gave to Jonathan Marks, which Jonathan Marks very strangely gave to a journalist called Jim Gaines. So we do. There is some audio recordings out there of Bernard Diamond and, and Milton Klein talking to Mark. But you're asking us to believe that if they were doing something nefarious with Mark, that they would just press play and record. I don't think so. No, yeah, they would. They wouldn't have that. And boy, that that sounds a lot like Jolly West visiting Jack Ruby's cell. You know, which which exactly. just came out fairly recently in the in the chaos research from um, O'Neill there. Um, yeah, I spoke to O'Neill. He's a really good help, Tom O'Neill. How uh, weird! I spoke to, yeah, I spoke. To, yeah, he's really weird. I spoke to him about this case a couple of years ago. He's a really Tom's brilliant. And that book, Chaos, he is fantastic. Is. He gave me a lot of advice about how to get information. And and, and Lisa Pease was another one who, who was a really great help. Oh, who great! Who did the great yeah. great RFK book? Uh, I think you guys might have spoken to her. Life too big to fail. Yeah, but yeah, those two on. books. Yeah, it's a Jolly West. Same thing. Uh, 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 MK Ultra operative getting into people's, you know, into people's cells, and and who knows, you know, what he did to Jack Ruby, uh, and who knows what he said to him. But but yeah, these guys were there. These guys were CIA operatives of the worst kind. I mean, Klein was the guy. He wasn't there to kind of, you know, work on a truth serum or telepathy or all these other weird things that they were doing on MK Ultra. He was the guy that was hired to create a Manchurian candidate. He went on camera boasting about his ability to do that. And oh, we're asked to believe they drugged so many they drug so many people out of their minds. And and you know, I've heard that Colby actually um later on in life, because he converted, you know, to Catholicism and he had regret yeah. about the Phoenix program, maybe wanted to start talking. These those were the two big regrets, you know. He he actually felt remorse for being involved and knowing about these things. And of course they did experiments with children, with psychiatric patients, with um, soldiers in other countries. I mean, it's very, very dark stuff. So MK Ultra, it's, it's almost, I, I, I st I've studied it for years. And I still can't believe it. it, it it's staggering. It's shocking. But let's talk about drugs. Again, if, if Mark Chapman was hypnotized, we, we know that when they were, you know, building these guys to do these things, they were often using drugs. Mark Chapman had 114, 114 unidentified pills from three different sources in his hotel room, which yeah. the NYPD and the New York District Attorney's Office covered up. There was red pills, there were white pills, and there were three different sources. They assumed on the inventory that there might have been aspirins and vitamin C, vitamin D. If they were aspirins and vitamin C, vitamin D, surely that would have been on the bottle. Why did they have to assume that? If, if he was into vitamin, if he was into his health, just say he was into his health or he had a yeah. headache, he had aspirins. Yeah. But they went off to the lab for analysis, which the inventory states. There's no record of what the lab came back, back with on that. Really? So that, that is a bona fide, in my opinion, cover up because the NYPD and the district attorney's office must have known about these pills and they chose not to tell the public about them. And if you remember, if you've seen any documentary about Mark Chapman and John Lennon's killing, they are always on there, the DA's office and the NYPD, talking about Mark's bizarre hotel layout. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's got the Bible and he's got the Todd Rundgren tape and he's got the photographs. But they never mentioned the pills. It just seemed to have uh, slipped their mind. 
So did he kind of pivot from an obsession with Rundgren to Lennon or because in Bressler's book, they talk about, uh, he talks about that kind of like diss track that uh, Rundgren wrote about John Lennon. And then it ultimately kind of just being um, like a, a, a light jab, not meant to be taken too serious. No, I don't think there's any connection there. No, I, I spoke to friend. I spoke to the friend who actually got Mark into Todd Rundgren, who's a guy who's a guitarist and he's a rock guy, and he just said, "Look, he was just Rundgren was just one of these people that we both liked." Mark, yeah. uh, and Mark was more of a Todd Rundgren fan than he was ever a John Lennon fan. Mark, Mark wasn't obsessed with the Beatles. I mean, like right. everyone, he had Beatles records. He Casual had, fan. Yeah. Casual fan. Who wasn't? You know, who's not into yeah. the Beatles? But he was no Lennon obsessive. That's that's just there's no evidence for that. So it's just not true. So the book uh, is going to be called Give Me Some Truth, and will some the truth. film be called the same thing? When, when are we looking at the timeline for the film to come out? I hope so. The book book's definitely going to be coming out by the end of the year. The book's written. That's done. I'm very happy with that, um, and that's that can't be stopped now. Um, the All the notebooks and stuff that I've got, all the paperwork will be included in the book. I've uh, That's now, thankfully, in a way, in a nice safety deposit box, mm. uh, and, mm -hmm. I, and it's also been digitized, and that's all in the cloud, so all this information will be coming out to the public. Uh, the documentary, I was hoping it was going to come out by the end of the year. It may go a little bit beyond into 2024. We'll see. Uh, again, it's, I'm, I'm not going to put anything out that's got my name on it unless editorially it puts out everything that I want it, want it to put out. That's all I'll say on, on the documentary for now. But the book's not going to hold any punches. I'm going to name names of who I think was uh, a bad influence on Mark Chapman, let's call it that way, uh, and who I've got questions to answer. Um, and I will show the links back to Richard Nixon and back to far right elements such as the John Birch Society and other uh, rather dubious um, uh, entities. And I, I'm fairly certain now after three years who coerced slash groomed Mark Chapman to be standing in that Dakota driveway thinking he was doing something he wasn't doing. The only question that needs asking, I think, is was mark a willing uh, participant or was he was he not really understanding what he was doing i think if you look at all the evidence and what he said on the night it seems to me like he was under some kind of hypnosis um control which is obviously what lisa pease and rfk jr believe was the case with siren siren it's the classic mm -hmm. case of a manchurian candidate and a second shooter Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, Sirhan had had, you know, three or four Tom Collins. You know, he was a little guy and uh, one of the cops said his pupils were dilated and he just looked totally out of it. And um, didn't one of the police officers mention kind of a similar thing about Chapman that he thought maybe he was uh, like, you know, a drug? Yeah. Yeah. Lieutenant, yeah. Arthur O'Connor said he, he looked programmed to him. I've also got a witness that no one's seen before that came a couple of hours before the murder, was walking by and did a witness statement to Ron Hoffman. And they said he was glazed like a zombie looking at mm. them. So he wasn't all there, Mark, at that point. This was just a couple of hours before the murder. We've got other people who came, secondary witnesses like Sean Strube, who said he was he had a kind of strange smirk on his face and he looked kind of out of it. Most people have who saw him on the night said he was acting in a very bizarre... You, you know, after you've just shot someone to become famous, and you've achieved your goal and you're going to become, you know, as famous as John Wilt Booth or whatever, and you, you know, you're, you're going to be eternal, you've reached your goal. Why would you just take your coat off and read a book? Mm. It, it doesn't make any sense. It just, I, I think Mark was meant to run. I think the people who put Mark there, I don't think Mark Chapman was meant to stand there reading a book. I think they wanted him to run. And I think there was possibly someone else who was going to take him out potentially after he ran. It, it, Mark was a loose end. If Mark was there under nefarious intent, the people that did that would not want Mark Chapman standing there reading a book. They would have wanted him to run away as he was instructed to do by Jose Padermo. Um, and it, it, a little bit like Lee Harvey Oswald, you know, it, it's, 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 it's much better when you can have these loose ends no longer around. <laughs> Button it up. <laughs> Button it up. Button it up. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly what they did. Well, David, that's that's all. Um, it's just like I said before. It's it's fascinating. It's kind of earth shattering and paradigm shifting, and these are things that have kind of just been there, just below the surface. Uh, if you're willing to look and have the interest and the courage, so I just you know I want to thank you, man, for digging into all this and, and taking what sounds like the better part of the last three years, just going very very deep into this stuff and being willing to put it out there. Um, you know because. 
like you said, to a lot of people, whether it's in the mainstream or the, the indie world, the pop culture world, the film world, um, a lot of people do lack courage. And it's peer pressure. You're scared of what other people are going to say about you. What are they going to think about you? What is this going to do to my reputation? But when you reach a point where that kind of just falls by the wayside and you don't really give a shit anymore, you can speak from the heart and speak truthfully about this stuff. So I think you're oh, to thank be- Thank you. Appreciate you're, you're that. To, absolutely, man. You're to, com to be commended for this. And I'm really psyched to get your book and then, you know, get this documentary out. And certainly- We'll talk again. Come, absolutely. If you're going to come stateside to do any promotion, uh, we'd love sure. to try and put an event together with you. Um, and then obviously- uh, we want to have you on again, and I want to hear your thoughts. Uh, you were mentioning George Harrison um, yeah. before we were rolling. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. He's my favorite Beatle. I'm a, I'm a George fanatic. I love his music. But uh, yeah, before we we uh, wrap up here, just tell people where they can find you and how they can support you in your work. Thank you. Yeah, well, I've, I'm starting to write some articles um, directly from the book uh, on davidwheeland.substack.com. Uh, and that's going to be updated throughout the year until the book comes out. So there's a lot of new information on there that I think people will find interesting. Uh, I've also got a YouTube channel and Instagram account, Assassination of Lennon. Please, uh, please go there and, and, and look at the images. And, you know, I've, I've put images up there from the notebooks and, and the paperwork that I've got. And I'm going to keep on putting up new stuff up there all the time. There's also some old videos on there that I put up, which, you know, gives a lot of the game away with regards to where John was shot and where the bullet holes were. And, you know, I see this now, guys, as an ongoing investigation. So what I want to say to everyone out there who's starting to get interested in this, help me, help, help John. Clearly, there was no investigation. So, you know, go digging, guys. You know, I, I, the, people like Mark Lane and, and uh, you know, Jim Garrison, you know, they started a revolution in the JFK you know, story. And once those guys started to investigate, it became a snowball and more and more people got on board and, and more and more things came out. Even to this day, there's new stuff coming out about JFK. So what I hope will happen here is people will pick up my baton and start to go digging themselves and start to ask questions. And I fully understand how people don't want to do that. And I fully understand after 42 years of being told something to hear something else, you know, completely counter to that is, is, especially about something that's so emotional, I can fully understand why people are, are angry and upset. And, and I get that. And, you know, it's, but, you know, I really want to thank you guys for having such an open mind and letting me, let me talk for so long and uh, put up with my crazy dog. And, uh, and uh, it's been a pleasure, it's been an absolute pleasure, guys. I, I really appreciate the opportunity to do this. Of course. Thank you for coming on, David. Yeah, we appreciate it. And, and we'll definitely uh, talk again. Great. Thanks, guys. Really enjoyed it. Have a great day. Yeah. You too. Well, thanks for tun tuning in, everybody. And um, if you haven't subscribed to this channel, check out David's stuff, uh, his Substack and his Instagram page and YouTube. He's doing very interesting work. And if you want to become a patron of this show, we are our viewer and audience funded completely, uh, patreon.com slash Jackman Radio. So until next time, everyone have a great day and enjoy yourselves. Thanks, guys. See ya. Thank you. Thank you.